I'm not uh, having to sit somewhere else because I notice like when I, I get to the court, okay. I support my head. <laughs> yeah, you just have a seat anywhere. Then it's not assigned seating. So wherever you want to sit is fine. Okay. And I um wanted to show you. I know I wasn't here the other day. Okay. And I did chapter two, three, and four. Okay, I'll get your scores in just a moment. I'll go ahead and sit in the back just because I'm so big. She has probably getting in and out. Maybe she's not coming today. Maybe she's not coming today. She has to order I only get in the way when she can go here. I tried to do the blood pressure thing by myself at home. Uh -huh. It was tricky. It was a little tricky. Did you watch the video? I did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I did. I was trying to. I was trying to hear the first song and the last, and uh, I was a bit unsuccessful. Yeah, it can be a little bit tricky at first. Yeah, we'll talk about that here. We'll get better. You will. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get your scores for chapter four. Uh, Donovan? Rajni? Can I get one, two, and three from your uh, room? Two, nine, five. Okay. One, eight. I don't have okay, no problem. I'll get that. Yeah, three by any chance. Uh, I get it, but I do uh, that's fine, no problem. So Monday I'll do this. No problem. Right. Crystal. Uh for chapter two, I got one wrong. Okay. Uh chapter three, I got three wrong. Okay. Chapter four, I got two wrong. Okay, very good. Cynthia? 100. Thank you. Yvonne? 85. Thank you. Wilma? No problem. Hart, Kari's not here. Leah? Stephen? 100. Thank you. Amber? Not here. All right. Does anybody have any questions on what you've missed? Is there anything that you missed that you need me to explain to you? Uh, probably uh, the one that says uh, what is not involved in post? Oh, for chapter three. Oh, that was that okay was for it. chapter three. Okay. All right. So the question is, what is what is not involved in post mortem care? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What did you choose? I chose close the patient eyes, and this one said the answer was. And notify the family of the death. Right. CNAs generally don't do death notifications. That's usually left up to the nurse. Yeah. So that wouldn't be an appropriate action for a CNA in most settings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of important because families usually have a lot of questions. You know, when you tell a family member that somebody died, they have questions, and those questions aren't things that you can answer. But it even goes further than that. 
just last week, we had two situations where somebody was transferred to the, the morgue or the funeral home and they weren't dead. Oh, oh, oh. In Jamaica. oh yes. Yes, it's something that like in Jamaica. Ooh. Sometimes when they reach in the refrigerator, that is when they find out they're not dead. Right. Most times they are diabetic patients. So we have to be aware that CNAs do not declare that people are dead, that that's not a CNA task that must be done by a nurse. And even nurses sometimes get it wrong. Yeah. So that's CNAs don't, we don't declare that somebody's dead. We don't notify that they're, that's, that's not our job preparing the, the um, body for transport, that is our job. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really surprised me that we had two in, in a very short amount of time. Yeah. I knew a man that went to that but it's over and they declared him dead and they had him in the, 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 the cooler for about five days. Oh my God. And when the family was planning the funeral, he woke up in the refrigerator and was banging. Oh and God. they were yeah. Oh my God. And until now that man is alive. Wow. wow. Yeah, it happened in Jamaica plenty of times. So because of that now, when they declare dead, the doctor declare dead, they take you to the morgue and they'll put you in the pool until about two days. They, they keep you in the coolage, but they don't put you in the, the freezer. Because sometimes they get up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Sounds like yeah. more training is needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are there any other questions that I can help you with? Any other questions? Okay. All right. So today we have four skills to go over. None of them are overly difficult. We're going to cover scoot and roll, which is another principle. We have covered most of this earlier when we did make an occupied bed on Monday, but we're gonna go over it again and explain it a little bit better. And um, we're gonna learn how to do range of motion. We're going to learn foot care, which is just like hand and nail care, but on the foot. Um, so it's, you know, the, the same processes are in place, not a lot to learn there. And we're going to learn um, how to assist somebody with a bedpan. And believe it or not, the most important part of that skill has nothing to do with the actual bedpan. So I want to explain to you why there's a step that if you miss it, you'll fail the test. And it's actually pretty important. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too and toileting methods and those types of things. I'm also going to give you the test registration packets today and we're gonna go over them together. Um, and then you can register whenever you're ready to register. Mm -hmm. So for some of you, it may be today. Some of you may have to wait on paychecks or your vacation schedule that you're trying to work around or something like that. And we'll talk about the whole testing process um, uh, right before we leave today. Okay, so that's gonna take up the last, about half hour, 45 minutes of class. We'll go through that. And as always, I have resources for you. We have a whole test registration video where I actually do a test registration on the screen and show you what I'm putting where that you can follow along. And then we have step-by-step -step slides if you wanna slow that down to be able, you can read the slide, do the step. It allows you to, to uh, control the, the time. So I've got all sorts of resources for you to make it a little bit easier. We're gonna talk about background checks too. Who needs one, why you need one and where to get it. So all that stuff will be covered um, toward the end of class today. All right, but first let's start with supported sideline positions. So go to page 98. Before we get into that, I do want to talk to you a little bit about chapter four. So chapter four talked about all of these body systems, right? 
And this can get really like in depth. Those of you who are going on for nursing, you have to go through anatomy and physiology one and two and microbiology to be able to get into the nursing program. Um, and there's some other uh, prerequisites as well, like nutrition and things like that. But a and one and two, these are semester long. So basically you're going to learn about the body for an entire year before you can even get into the medical pro the nursing program. So it's pretty in depth, right? What you had in chapter four was a general overview of these body systems. It's not in depth at all. But I still think that the textbook that you have complicates it a little more than it needs to. So really quickly, I just wanna go through and explain why this is important. Because body systems do not live alone. Body systems live with other body systems. Uh, the best way for me to explain this, when you were growing up, when somebody in your house was having a bad day, you knew it. How did you know that somebody in your house was having a bad day? Okay, their behavior changed, right? They might be slamming doors or getting short with other people. They might be not eating because they're depressed. I mean, there, there, there's some signs there that they're having a bad day. Now, when you're living in a house with other people, you learn their behaviors and their habits, and you can tell when things are off, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, remember, none of these body systems live alone. They live in a house with eight other body systems, and they get to know those body systems really, really well. So when something goes wrong with one of these, the others are going to feel it and in a large part, react to it, okay? So if we have a patient who, well, uh, uh, we'll use the example that um, we were talking about earlier. Let's say that we have a patient who is bed bound, not active, and hasn't had a bowel movement in seven days, okay? Now, this gets affected, right? When, when you're bed bound, that's gonna affect your digestion because food doesn't move through your intestinal system very well all by itself. It actually relies on the muscles of your abdomen to move that food along. So when you're sitting and standing and walking and bending and moving, that's actually making your digestive system move the food through your digestive system. This is one of the reasons why they recommend 15 minutes of activity every day is to get that food moving the way it's supposed to. Well, if we got a patient in bed, clearly the intestines aren't moving the way they should and stuff can get backed up. Okay, we call it constipated. So this patient has been in bed. We know that constipation is a um, potential consequence. And remember, as a nurse, it's my job to look for all real problems and potential problems. So I should really have something in the care plan about this, whether it's I want you to do range of motion exercises every shift to get that, you know, that stuff moving or encourage fluid intake to make sure that everything's staying liquid and not hardening up on us or maybe turn and reposition the patient every two hours because they're in bed just to have some sort of muscle activation. I mean, I've got something on the care plan that's addressing this somewhere, right? But I'm also relying on your observation skills. You need to let me know if there's a problem. I'm not in there with the patient all the time. You have to let me know. So we have a patient who's in bed. We have a clear problem here with the gastrointestinal system because they haven't pooped in seven days. And nobody tells me. I have no idea that this is an issue. Nobody's saying a word because let's face it, as CNAs, you have to clean up when they have a bowel movement and they're stuck in bed. You don't want to do that. So you're actually happy that they're not having bowel movements because it's less work for you. So you're not going to tell me because if you tell me, I'm going to give them something to get them going. And that's going to cause a huge mess for you, which is more work. So 
you don't want to tell me, right? But what kind of consequences that have on the patient? If they haven't pooped in seven days and they're stuck in bed and nothing is really moving in there, what kind of consequence would that have on the patient? Anybody ever been back up? Anybody ever been constipated? Yeah, it makes you feel icky. Yeah. Right? It, and it starts to really take up all of your brain because, oh my gosh, I've got to go. This is something's got to be done here, right? So, um, I forgot my microphone here. So, we have to be aware that this has real world consequences. Now, these consequences can get really, really severe. So, uh, Extreme example of this is if our patient hasn't had a bowel movement in seven days, that poop has got to go somewhere and it starts to back up. Well, the first thing that happens is the fluid that's inside that poop starts to get reclaimed by the body. So now we don't just have poop, we have hard poop, which is really, really hard. But that fluid that's being reclaimed by the body has toxins in it. So what do you think that does to the patient? Why it body? Yeah, absolutely. It gives them something that they have to fight. And that can ultimately, in extreme cases, kill patients. So this isn't something that's really minor. This is a problem in one part of the body the gastrointestinal system that is eventually going to affect every single body system here because it's not being addressed. Does that make sense? Same thing with diabetes, right? We know diabetes is a blood sugar issue. All right, everybody kind of has that idea. Diabetes means you have high blood sugar, but what does that even mean? We're going to talk about that. Um, so we know it's a blood sugar issue. So you think, okay, well, that has to do with the blood. So it's a circulation problem, right? Blood sugar, but it's actually not. It's an endocrine problem. Now it's going to affect the blood system because that's what takes the blood sugar around. And that excess sugar is going to affect the kidneys. It's going to affect the blood vessels. It's gonna affect the brain. It's going to affect the lymphatic system. It's going to even affect the musculoskeletal system as well. And uh, obviously the gastrointestinal system is affected, um, can actually affect the reproductive system as well. That's something a lot of people don't talk about, but it can affect reproduction. Um, and yeah, it'll affect the skin as well because the skin is going to get dried out and stretched and we end up with uh, skin issues predominantly ulcers that form. We're going to talk about all that a little bit later in the program. So diabetes, although we think it's a blood sugar issue, is actually an issue that affects the entire body. But it doesn't stop there. Almost every condition that a patient can have is going to affect more than just that part of the body. So if you've got somebody who's had a hip replacement, that's going to affect more than just the hip. Ow. We need to be aware of that because that's where the care plan is going to give us very specific instructions, what we expect and what we want to be notified about and how to prevent complications from occurring. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about chapter four, I don't want you to get like um, all caught up in the details of it. You know, a stroke is a disorder of the nervous system. You know, that's not really what I want you to know. What I want you to know is what are the signs of a stroke? What do I need to report to the nurse? That's what I need you to know. So big diseases, big conditions, what are the signs of those conditions? that I need to report to the nurse. So if you are feeding a patient lunch and the patient all of a sudden starts to slur their words as you're looking at them, one side of their face is starting to droop. Um, they're not making any sense. Yeah, so we need to know right away that is not normal. Even if, I don't care if you know it's a stroke, 
You're not diagnosing anything. That is not your job. What I do want you to be aware of is something is wrong with this patient. I probably should stop feeding them. Because if they're having a stroke and you still shovel food in their mouth, they're likely to aspirate or breathe that into their lungs. And now we've got a way bigger problem, right? So the first thing we have to address is safety. Let's not finish lunch before we notify the nurse. Let's stop feeding and notify the nurse. <laughs> Does that make sense? Those are the types of things that they're going to ask you about on the state exam. They're not going to ask you, you know, you're feeding a patient at lunch, their face starts to droop and their um, words become slurred. What is this patient suffering from? That is not the question they're going to ask you. They're going to give you that question and ask you, what is your first action? Well, the first action is stop feeding them. <laughs> Good. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another one. This one gets missed a lot on the state exam. Something similar to this. Turn this on. Patient, uh, you, you took the patient to the dining room for lunch. You're bringing them back to their room and they complain of uh, chest tightness, heaviness, and a little bit of difficulty breathing. So it asks you, what are you going to do with that? Uh, the first option, A, would be have them lie down, take their vital signs and monitor them for 15 minutes. B would be get them in a safe location and notify the nurse. C would be call 911. Or D, Ask them if they're having any other symptoms. Yeah, B is the right answer. Believe it or not, a lot of people have them lie down and take their vitals. That's something that a lot of people choose, thinking that, well, in that case, you're thinking like a nurse, aren't you? Are we nurses? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, we'll get there, but not yet. So the time that you, took to get them to lie down and go get the vital machine and take their vitals, that's all time that could have been used by the nurse for assessment. So you need to let the nurse know right away, hey, chest heaviness, tightness, a little short of breath, they're in a safe location here, I'll go get the vital machine, but you need to let the nurse know right away. It's not our job to diagnose. It's our job to ensure safety and notify. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So I want you to have that mindset when you're doing the written tests. Now, be careful what written tests you use. This, this just really kind of gets under my skin a little bit. If you go into your favorite search engine and you type in CNA practice test, a million of them will come up. There's some on YouTube as well. The problem is you have no idea who's writing those questions or where those questions came from, or more appropriately, if those questions are even indicative of what you're gonna find on the state exam. For instance, there was a question that I saw recently on a CNA practice test asking, what is the type of bacteria or I'm sorry, what is the type of a, yeah, a bacteria that eats other harmful bacteria? Now, if you're taking a CNA practice test online and you see that question, you're automatically going to assume, oh my gosh, I don't know this answer. Clearly, I'm not ready for the test. That's not on the test. It has nothing to do with the test. This is somebody who was looking through a textbook somewhere who wrote a question that has nothing to do with, it's like putting a plumbing question on a coding exam. I mean, it, wrong industry. <laughs> so you have to be really careful about the resources that you're using online to practice with because they may actually cause you to doubt your own abilities. Now, if they got questions like that on there, 
you know that some of the questions also have the wrong answer because they're not paying close attention. So be careful about the, the resources that you choose to use to study, okay? There's a lot of misleading information out there and I don't want them to derail you. And we've had several students that did not go take the state exam. They went through class, they graduated, they were all ready. But when they started doing practice tests, they thought they didn't know enough and they just never went and tested. And then they end up in my class again, two or three years later, because now they, they really have to go to work and they don't remember what they needed to remember. So now they're back in my class again. And I feel really bad because you could have been working this whole time. You know, don't let other people derail you. I will let you know when you're ready. And you have to have a little confidence in me. Okay. My students pass. They do. We just had two people contact me yesterday. Um, these are people that did nothing more than watch my videos on YouTube. That's all they did. Didn't come to class, didn't order the book, didn't have any conversations with me, just watched my videos on YouTube, took the test and passed it. So how much further along are you gonna be sitting in the classroom, okay? You guys, you're gonna be okay. But be careful about what you, what sources you're using. There are some good ones out there. I, you know, I, I'm not saying that they're all bad. You just be careful, be selective. All right, so we're gonna talk about sideline position. This is on page 98 of your skills book. How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan, yep, care plan. All right, so this care plan says, position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. I want you to pay attention to that. Now, words mean something in this game. It says, patient is unable to assist with turning. Does it say they're immobile, unable to move at all? It says they're unable to assist with turning. Don't confuse the two. Unable to assist with turning means they probably have an incision right down the middle and they can't flop one side of their body over. It doesn't mean that they're paralyzed. Those two terms do not mean the same thing. So be careful not to let your brain run away with a concept. Words mean something. If it says unable to assist with turning, that's all they're unable to assist with. So I can ask this patient, can you scoot toward me? That's okay. Now, if they were immobile, it would say that there and I would have to move the patient either in segments or using a draw sheet or a slide sheet, my care plan would tell me what I'm supposed to use for this patient, okay? I'll give you a good example of why care plans are important. And unfortunately, not all nurses know how to write good care plans. So if you have a question, you need to ask the nurse for clarification. But let me give you a really good example of this. A patient, Little tiny, teeny tiny, 92 year old woman, teeny tiny, weighs maybe 90 pounds soaking wet. And she has compression fractures from osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis makes your bones into Swiss cheese. So they don't really hold together all that well. This patient had severe osteoporosis to the point that their vertebrae actually cracked, right? Their, their, their bones of their spine just kind of shattered. So these are called compression fractures. And you can have compression fractures of a lot of different places of the body, but the spine is the most common. So we've got this little itty bitty 90 year old woman who weighs 90 pounds soaking wet, who has osteoporosis and compression fractures in bed. Now we can't get her out of bed real well anymore because when you try to move her, we break something, right? So she's stuck in bed. Now you are asked 
to change her position every two hours around the clock because she's stuck in bed and we don't want that constipation problem and we don't want bed sores to form and we don't want her to get pneumonia. And all of these things can be prevented simply by turning her every two hours. So you are asked to go in and change her position every two hours. Now there's nothing there that says that, you know, how you're supposed to uh, scoot her towards you. She can't scoot on her own, but nothing there that tells you. So you just grab her and start moving her in segments. Now, remember when you're moving her in segments, you're moving her hips and then her shoulders. She has dust where her spine should be. Do you think that's a good idea? No. So for her, the care plan should say, use a draw sheet to move her body before turning. That keeps her spine in alignment because we're using it like a sling, right? So the, the method that you use here actually matters. The problem is that not all nurses write good care plans and you've got a CNA who nothing on the care plan. So I'm just going to move the patient in segments. I'll come up with an idea on my own, move the patient in segments. And when you do that, it actually severs her spinal cord. Now we have a paralyzed patient. And whose fault is that? Yeah, ours. Ours. We actively impact patients' health more than any other person caring for this patient. And we have four weeks of education. This is one of those situations where a little bit of knowledge can have disastrous consequences because we're spending the most time with the patients and we don't always have enough information to work with. This is why you need to be fully entwined with your nurse. This is why it needs to be a team sport. And unfortunately, I see all the time that it's not. Um, if your nurse is giving you attitude because you go and ask them, hey, how do you want me to move this patient, segments or draw sheet, and they give you an attitude over it, find a new place to work. You know, but if it's you versus the nurse, that patient is always going to lose, always, because the next time you're not going to ask. And you're going to just do things on your own because it's easier than getting grief from the nurse. And that's what's gonna put the patients at risk. Does that make sense? We gotta have a better system. Um, so it's funny that you said that the nurses don't make good care plans. So it's, so the nurses that are getting investigated in Florida, in Florida how do they even start to make good care plans uh, suitable for the patient? Okay, ah, you're talking about the 1700. Yes, the the mill. I don't even know where to even start making a care plan. There's like the ones that just buy. Yeah. The degree to the influx to pass. It's like how do they even get through? Right, it's very dangerous, isn't it? So just like before you came to class, you had an idea of what CNAs did right? You, you kind of had this idea. I've probably changed a few of your ideas in the last two weeks. I've probably given you some more things to think about that maybe hadn't crossed your mind before, right? That's the purpose of education. It's not to reinforce what you know. It's to fill in gaps that you don't even know you've got, right? So care plan, that's a mighty big gap that these individuals don't even know that they have. So how do they, there's no way to go about filling it, right? So what he's talking about is there was a school, actually a couple schools down in South Florida who literally 
if you came to them with money, they would hand you a nursing diploma and that would allow you to go sit for the nursing tests, the NCLEX. And if you passed it, you became a nurse. And now these nurses are working in, I think, five states. This, there's 1,700 of them right now that they've identified that are nurses without the education. That is truly frightening because of this, right? Yeah, they, they have no idea how to write a care plan because they probably didn't even realize that care plans were an important part of nursing. They're looking at, you know, how do we put bandages on? How do we give medications? Though, you know, how do we read lab results? You know, the, those nursing tasks that are way up here, that's what we think of when we think of nursing, right? Adjusting IV flow rates, hanging IV, you know, those types of things. That's what we think of with nursing. This is truly nursing. Nurses are the only ones that look at the body as an entire individual, the whole thing. They understand all nine body systems, how they work together, and they figure out how do we keep this patient from declining while the doctors work their magic on a body part, right? But most people don't realize that that is the majority of what nursing is. It's all this chaos coordination <laughs> that we call a care plan. And if you just bought your diploma and you don't know anything about this, then the people that are working under you don't have good direction. So now you've got an entire workforce of CNAs that are literally making it up as they go because there's no direction. <laughs> so yeah, this has a huge cascading ripple effect. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and I, you know, unfortunately, I think it's probably the tip of the iceberg. I really do. Well, I wonder, is that going to, it's going to like trickle down because if a lot of the majority of nurses that have to take licenses are going to get caught, it's going to obviously lead to a lack of training. We already have a nursing, yeah, already have a nursing shortage. This is not going to do any favors in making it. And you have to remember that it takes a minimum minimum of three years, minimum of three years to push out a new nurse. Now, new CNAs, we can have you guys trained and ready to go in a matter of, you know, four to six weeks, even less in Florida. I mean, if you go back, remember, I'm live streaming all these classes, right? So if somebody goes on to my YouTube channel, they can watch all 32 hours. They put me on double speed. They can get it done in 16, register for the test and go take the test. And chances are they'll pass because I make sure that you have the information that you need, right? I have a simple thing that, that could not read. When I say could not read, could not read. And they came to her and in space of athletic, and we are doing nursing. And I said, oh, they said, Come in, after you go to school, the first of your adventure. And they said they are nursing there. And it's true. I know a lot of them. Wow. How they get in it, I don't know. Right. And when we were going to school, they couldn't do their transfers, I can tell you. And they came from Jamaica, came up there, and they were nurse. Wow. Or a CNA. Where did they go and study? I don't know. Yeah. Because they couldn't do such a hard time. Yeah, that's that is yeah, that's true. And they're all in New York. Yeah. New York here. I can't tell you that. Well the History. the real problem is if they okay, if they can't read, how do you get through education? Oh, but if they right. but but go a, a step further, if you can't read, well, how are you deciphering you this? <laughs> oh my gosh. Not just nurses, I, my ex friend, ex friend of 47 years, um, she faked out of grief um, and she's working with safe kids. And her, she's got disabled kids as well. She's faking out of grief yeah. and she's making movement about the health care. Of the rich clients in New York, of course. Of course. Uh, 
<laughs> Remind me not to. Never mind. <laughs> I don't want to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of scary. And, and I, she had recruited me, and the minute I went once or twice, and I saw the way she was operating, and these poor people have no idea. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not no part of it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it is true. It's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we need good CNAs that have good observation skills, and we need them to have good relationships with good nurses, you know, good nurses who can write good care plans and give good direction, and... Um, you know, good nurses that will work with the CNAs and understand that you're not there to do all the grunt work. You're there to help me do tasks that I could do and I would do if I had time, but because I am overloaded with patients, they give me people like you to help do some of these routine tasks to free my time up to do more of the nursing tasks. It's a partnership. If you take the CNAs away, the nurses would have to do all of the tasks with the patients. And I think some nurses have forgotten that. You know, I, I do believe that that is reality. I, and I've heard it. I've heard nurses say, that's why I went to nursing school so I don't have to change a bedpan. Yeah. And no, you've missed, you missed the point of nursing school then. <laughs> yeah, you missed the point. So yeah, I, you know, and people do accuse me of being um, naive, you know, and, and I do like to believe that everybody has the best version of themselves that they can be if they just gave it a good try, you know, um, and my job is to encourage you to be the best person you can be, especially when it comes to patient care. Unfortunately, I can't change everybody out there, but if I'm at least a light in the darkness that tells you how it should be, um, you know, maybe we can cause a change. And this is why I ask you, you know, I, when I go through these skills and I teach you how to do the skills and I teach you why things should be done a certain way, like we're going to check the water and we're going to let the patient check the water because there's a consequence there. Right. So I explained to you the why behind what we're doing in an effort to make it sink in so that when you're out there and another CNA says, oh, yeah, we don't have time for that here. You're, everything you learn in school, just throw out the window because it's not how we're going to do it here. I want my voice in the back of your head saying, but wait, how does that impact the patient? That's why I go the extra mile and I make sure I explain all of the whys because it's going to matter out there. It's going to matter on your test too, but that's not my focus. When I was working at public in the belly, when I do this, everybody cried. They said, What are you doing so good? We don't watch no so shine. We don't listen. That is all I learned in Jamaica how to do the thing. Right. So you know, it's too good. You should do show that because of that. No, nobody wants to do the dishes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, and now you're doing all the dishes. <laughs> yeah, and no, we pay back now. We want to tell them to be public. They have to do them properly. Right. Some of them will use that they have a big hole here to use to do the floor. Some of them will use it and do the dishes. Because they don't want to check the water. You have three bowls. One wash, one rinse, one sanitize. They don't want to do it those the, the mile, the extra mile. So they will just take that big bowl there, like this we used to sanitize the floor in the night, and they will just spray it. And, <laughs> and I'm saying to them, you know, sometimes you, you work some places, you eat some places, you don't know what they eat. I would say to them, no, if they put a hole to cover the floor, and they gave the three sinks to what they did with him, three pipes right here with the sinks, under the bed. So why you use the wood? They don't yeah. have the time. Yeah, it's all about so integrity. It really it, does. It it boils. Doing it too properly. I said no. That is all I know. Do what this is. Yeah. You understand? It boils down to integrity. Integrity is doing the right thing, even when nobody's looking. Right. You know, because it's the right thing. It, it's it's that internal drive to do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because of fear of consequences. 
Um, and, you know, unfortunately, integrity can be taught, but it's hard to enforce. It really is because a lot of the times you're doing things when nobody's looking. So, you know, it, it's hard. And human nature is to get away with anything that we can get away with. And yeah, yeah, I think as a society, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're in trouble, but that's not why I'm here today. <laughs> today, we're going to talk about how to change position. So this patient, for whatever reason, has something going on. We don't know. We don't care. Not our job. Our job is to turn them on their left side. Now, I want to talk to you about immobility for a minute because I told you this patient is not immobile. It doesn't tell us they're immobile, but I do want to talk about immobility. So let's get into that. When you have an immobile patient or a patient that can't get out of bed for whatever reason, we have some rules we're going to follow here. We're going to turn and reposition them every two hours around the clock. We're going to get to that in a minute, but at 2 a.m., we're in there waking them up, turning them over. At 4 a.m., we're waking them up and turning them over. At 6 a.m., at 8 a.m., at 10 a.m., and so on. It doesn't ever stop, and that's because of circulation, respiration, and digestion. Those are the three main things that we're looking at. There's also some effect on the nervous system and musculoskeletal system and other things, but those are the three main things we're looking at. But in order to do that, we always have to make sure that the patient remains in the middle of the bed. So after the turn, they need to be in the middle of the bed. We can't use side rails to keep them safe. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we're not going to have side rails in all settings. They, they just don't exist in a lot of settings. Um, we're going to have the patient scoot toward us and then roll away from us. Remember, we talked about that on Monday. Patient always rolls away. And we want to remain behind the patients behind. The whole goal here is that the patient must remain in the middle of the bed. So if they're on their back, they're in the middle of the bed. If they're on their side, we scoot them toward us and then roll them. So on their side, they're in the middle of the bed. They're always at the end of, of the position in the middle of the bed. Well, let's talk about side rails. Because this is a topic that gets really mixed up for CNAs. So if I've got a baby, a child, and I wanna make sure that child is safe, I'm probably gonna put them in a crib or a playpen, something that limits their mobility. They're a child. This is appropriate for children. We don't really have free range children, right? But at some point, at some point, that child is going to grow and they're going to learn how to climb out of this safe space. So when they climb out, that is a far drop to the floor. Now, this thing that was supposed to keep them safe is no longer safe. So we generally take them out of the crib and put them into a little toddler bed. So if they fall out, it's a shorter drop to the floor, right? This is very reasonable, isn't it? Well, we do this with children all the time. Crib, once they crawl out of the crib, toddler bed, right? Okay, I don't know why we think that this is acceptable for adults when they're trying to climb out of it. It's not acceptable for kids when they're trying to climb out of it. They need a low bed near the floor. But adults, we put them in a bed with side rails. And if they climb out, it's a far drop to the floor. And we think, oh, that's okay. If it's not okay for kids, it is not okay for adults. And that's the problem with side rails. Side rails do not keep a patient in bed any more than this keeps an unruly one-year-old in the crib. All it does is provide an obstacle for them to go over, which increases the risk of injury. Does that make sense? Okay, well, we finally figured this out because in the 70s, everybody had side rails. 
In the 80s, when I went to nursing school, everybody had side rails. In fact, if you didn't have the side rails up on a bed, you got written up. We thought this was appropriate. Well, at what age did you decide or, or did you gain the ability to be able to get up and go to the bathroom when you have to go? How old were you when? Yeah. So you've been taking care of your own bathroom needs for quite some time. Right? Now, just because you go into a facility does not mean that now all of a sudden you are willing to give up your rights to go to the bathroom when you need to go. I don't know about you, but I am not willing to give that particular right up. Because I know that when I'm in a facility and I'm in a bed and those side rails are up and I hit that call light, gotta pee. It could be hours before somebody comes in to help me with that particular task. Hours, which means that I'm now forced to make a decision. Either I go over the side rails to get myself to the bathroom or under the side rails or around the side rails, or in some cases through the side rails, right? All of those things can lead to, to injury. Or I can pee myself. Those are my only two options. Get around the side rails and go to the bathroom or pee myself. Which one do you think I'm gonna choose? Oh, absolutely. I am not going to be undignified because of your convenience not going to happen. And that's the problem with side rails. Patients, adult patients have physical needs that if you're not going to help them with, they will darn sure make sure they are going to get those needs met themselves. And any amount of your hopping up and down and yelling at them and waving your arms and saying, I told you not to get out of bed means absolutely nothing because they are an adult. For some reason in healthcare, we seem to think that if a patient is in need of help, that means that they all of a sudden give up all of their rights and we get to tell them what to do with their life. And that is absolutely stupid. It is just plain stupid. If you have a broken leg, that doesn't mean that you give up all of your adult rights. It just doesn't. And yet in healthcare, we kind of treat them like that. I have seen a lot of CNAs absolutely bash a patient for having the audacity to walk somewhere. I'm sorry, what? They have a right to walk. Your job is to walk beside them and keep them safe. Does that make sense? Now, I know that we're short-staffed. I get it. I do. I get it. And you can't be in all places at all times with all patients. I understand that too. But don't take that frustration out on this patient. This patient did not ask to be here. They did not ask to have whatever's going on with them go on. So we have to be careful not to put our patients in this category of child when they're clearly adults. You will have a test question on this, especially when it comes to dementia. Now, we do tend to think dementia patients are children. They're not, they're still adults, people. They may require a little bit more safety. They may be, require a little bit more um, intervention, but they're not children. And we don't treat them like children. They're still dignified adults that need that type of care, okay? So when we're talking about um, dementia patients, you're going to have a question on the state exam that's something like this. Remember, when you're thinking about this question, patients have rights, okay? So you are caring, you're over, working overnight, you're caring for an elderly male adult patient with dementia, who keeps getting out of bed. You've put them, put this patient back into bed four times already. 
and told him not to get out of bed. What is an appropriate action? A, put the side rails up to remind him not to get up. B, tie him to the bed until the morning. C, get him into a chair and engage him in an activity. Or D, call his doctor and insist on more dementia medication. Even yeah. We yeah, sure. Absolutely. C, we would want to get them in a chair and engage. If he's getting up, he's not sleepy. No amount of you wishing he would sleep is going to make him sleepy. <laughs> and yet we tend to think this way in a clinical setting. Well, I'll put the side rails up. I'll tie him to the bed. I'll do whatever I can to keep him there because I've got work to do and he's interfering with my... He's not interfering with your work. He is your work. Be careful about that. He's not interfering with your work. He is your work. So if he's getting out of bed, that means he clearly doesn't want to be in the bed, just like you. I have insomnia. You should see my sleep thing. If I, so, because I have my watch, it tracks my sleep at night. I have every night, no less than 20 spikes on the, the, because I wake up free. I don't sleep well. I never have. I am a night person. I tend to do better at night, which is why I don't sleep very well. So I know I'm going to be that person, <laughs> right? That's just how my, my, you know, circadian rhythm works. I am going to be that older person that does not go to bed at seven o'clock or if you try to put me to bed at seven o'clock, I'm going to be up and down, up and down, up and down, because that's not how my brain works. No, they don't. No. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Get them involved in something. If they don't want to be in bed, don't make them be in bed. But we can't use side rails to force our patients around our way of thinking. And that we used to do this all the time, guys. In nursing homes, every patient was in bed with side rails up and most of them were drugged. Yeah, to keep them quiet and don't cause problems. Guys, prisoners get treated better than that. You know, even on death row, you get an hour outside every day. We treat our elderly worse than we treat prisoners on death row. They are, okay. So something changed along the way. We used to think this was appropriate. And then somebody said, well, wait a minute, hold up. There's a lot of injuries with these side rails. In fact, they kill, before we declared them a restraint, they were killing about 200 people a year. So something is clearly wrong here. And they reevaluated, they did some studies, and they found out that using side rails to limit mobility actually created much worse patients. So they came up with a different strategy. They said, okay, wait, we're going to call side rails a restraint because a restraint is anything that limits a patient's freedom of movement. And that really is the definition of a side rail, limits a patient's freedom of movement. So they declared them restraints. And now if we want to use side rails, we have to get a doctor's order. That doctor's order only lasts 24 hours. And that doctor has to physically come in and eyeball our patients within four hours of giving us that restraint order. So we can't just use them willy nilly anymore. There's a whole process in place. So, well, wait a minute. Well, I know that some patients really shouldn't be up walking around on their own. They're going to fall. This is a bad thing. How can we ensure the safety of our patient if we're no longer allowed to use side rails? Well, remember this guy, right? When they started climbing out, what do we do? Put them in a low bed near the floor. And if mom liked you, she put something soft on the floor. That way, if you rolled out of bed, you rolled onto something soft. We can do the same thing here. 
we have low beds that go all the way to the floor. And then we have mats that we put out on the floor. If they roll out of bed, they roll onto the mat and they still have freedom of movement, but we've ensured their safety. Now, I know the argument here, guys, I do. I used to give the argument, right? Well, I'm sorry, but my weak patient cannot get up and walk. They're too weak. I need side rails for this patient. They are too weak. They're going to fall. And a broken hip is way worse than what they've got going on now. I'm just trying to work on behalf of my patient here. Until somebody pointed out to me that the goal of medicine is to improve patient function. When you put a patient in bed with side rails up, you are doing absolutely nothing to improve their function. And in fact, limiting their mobility is going to cause atrophy. It'll limit their joint mobility. It'll cause their muscles to decrease, not just in size, but in strength. So now, plus you've got the whole digestion and respiration problems, pressure sores and all of that. So you have a whole lot of potential problems and you are not doing anything to improve their mobility. So using side rails as an excuse for their weak, well, if you're truly concerned about them being weak, let's do some things that make them stronger, that improve their mobility or their balance. Side rails do neither. There is no good argument for side rails. And once that was brought to my attention, I'm like, oh, you're right. I was using it as an excuse. So sometimes even the, the, the tales we tell ourselves aren't quite right. We have to have a different point of view. This is why we're always learning in medicine because your point of view may change with information that you're provided. Good. When I was um, in the hospital, hospital bed, uh, you know, I had, the side rails up, the side rails is up, and I'm here calling, calling nurse to come help me out. No one didn't want to come, so I took, I took my tail up, got the machine because I was hooked. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had to bring everything with me, slide, slide through in the middle, just get off. And yes, I did have a little trouble getting off the bed, but I managed to get to the bathroom because you know you don't want to pee on yourself right you know what I'm right but what they did was make it harder for you to accomplish that on your own all right so i want to tell you the difference show you the difference between positioning rails and side rails though if we're going to talk about side rails we have to cover this as well so we're going to go over here to this bed real quick All right, so there's two different terms here and it's important that we understand the difference. So this rail right here, this is not a side rail. This is actually called a positioning rail. It's got um, openings for handholds and it can help the patient boost themselves up in bed, turn over if they have mobility issues, but this doesn't impede the patient's ability of getting out of bed because of where it ends. The patient can just swing their legs out and still get out unimpeded. This is not considered a restraint. This is a positioning rail. This, if I put this one up, this is a restraint. Because if the patient wants to get out of bed now, they have to go through this small opening which can pinch or tear skin or get stuff caught, or they've got to scoot all the way down to the end of the bed to get out of that small opening, which again, causes problems, especially if you're hooked up to machines, or they just simply try to go over and that can end up with injury. So this is a positioning rail. This is a restraint, a side rail. Most hospital, most settings now have these completely off the bed. They're not even available to you. If we get an order, we have to call maintenance and they have to come attach these side rails to the bed. And they, yes, they have bed alarms as well. Okay. So good? 
You guys understand the difference between side rails and positioning rails? Okay, we now have things called restraint alternatives. A restraint alternative, we're gonna to get to this in a minute, but a restraint alternative is something that we can do instead of a restraint to make sure our patient stays safe. So if we can't use restraints on this patient, then we have a pad that we can put on the bed that lets us know when the pressure is released. So if they're standing up, if there's no pressure on the bed anymore, it rings an alarm to let us know, hey, somebody's up and moving. So somebody can go take a look to see. We have chair alarms as well that clip onto the clothing. And if they try to stand up, it breaks that connection and lets us know that they're up and moving. So somebody can check on them. We have restraint alternatives, but do you know what the number one thing you can do to keep a patient safe is? Answering the call light. It's the number one restraint alternative, just answer the call light. When I was working at a nursing home, when I was brand new nurse, thought I knew everything. I knew nothing. <laughs> I was a brand new nurse working at a nursing home and we got a brand new director of nurses in. And um, she was, nobody liked her. Nobody liked her. She was tough. She would go into a patient's room and she would, uh, she, studied every single input. She knew who worked in dietary, who worked in housekeeping, who was a CNA, who was a nurse. She knew you'd walk down the hallway and she would greet you by name. She knew them all. Within like two weeks, she was good. She'd go into a patient's room and she'd hit a call light. And not only did she time how long it took you to answer the call lights, but she would write down the name of anybody that she saw walk by that room. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you got an invitation to come meet with her in her office if you were on her list. You did not want to be on her list. And if you, she caught you three times, you were gone. There was no excuse for that because that call light represents an emergency. If it's a cup of water and your patient can't get up and get it themselves, that is an emergency. If your patient is bleeding out, that is an emergency. If your patient needs a blanket because they're cold and they can't get up and get it themselves, that is an emergency. And there isn't a single person in this facility that should walk by an emergency without dealing with it. She was good. And she whipped that, that, staff into shape and she took this nursing home from being having a really poor reputation to being one of the most sought after nursing homes there was a waiting list of people to get in because the staff cared the staff that was left cared about those patients and it showed i think we need more dons like her i really do um, and I, I think that that's a very good practice. If you see a call light, make sure it's not an emergency. Now, if you're walking down the hall and a call light's going off and it's not your patient, you don't have the care plans, you don't know how they toilet. So if you walk in and say, can I help you? And they say, well, yeah, I got to go to the bathroom. You don't know, do they use a bedside mode, a bedpan? Do they get to the bath? We don't know because we don't have their care plan. So your answer is, I'd be happy to help you with that, but I don't have your care plan. Let me get your CNA. I'll be right back. Go find somebody that can help them. Okay, don't ignore it. But ignored call lights, that is the one way of getting your facility a bad reputation. Ignored call lights. Yeah. My mom was in the hospital a couple of years ago. And of course I'm camping out at the hospital because <laughs> I'm me. Um, and you know, her roommate would hit the call light and it would be 45 minutes, an hour before somebody would just come in. So I started taking care of that patient because nobody should have a call light unanswered. So remember that you don't know who's watching. <laughs> you have no idea, you know. So make sure that you understand this.
All right, so I'm gonna to explain to you why we're turning a patient every two hours and the effects on the skin. So if you have a patient that is um, unable to turn on their own for whatever reason, can't change your own position, they're at risk for bed sore formation. I'm gonna show you how quick this can happen. So for the next two minutes, put one of your hands under your, your leg, just sit on one of your hands. I'm only gonna ask you to do this for two minutes. And I know that your hand is going to get uncomfortable in this two minutes. You're gonna to wanna to pull it out and move it, don't. Stick with me because I wanna show you something and it's actually pretty important. So when we have, we have gravity on planet earth, right? Gravity, gravity is pulling everything down. So whatever surface is closest to the center of the earth, all of your body weight is being pulled down through that point. So right now my feet, right? All of my body weight is being tried to pull down through my feet. So my feet are trying to support a lot. If you're sitting, that's your backside, right? The, the gravity is trying to pull your weight down through that. If you're laying down, it's the whole surface of your body that gravity is trying to pull that body weight down through. And this is actually pretty important because as your body is being pulled down, you have layers of your skin, right? You've got skin, you've got fat, we got muscle, we got blood vessels. We talked about this on Monday. And as your body weight is being pulled down, it's actually compressing these layers. So where we started out like this, all of that weight is pancaking and pancaking and pancaking and pancaking. And over time, you end up with not much padding there, right? And this doesn't take long to happen. You've got about 15 more seconds for that two minutes. I know it feels like a long time, doesn't it? You're probably getting antsy. You want to take your hand out. But when you take your hand out in just about five seconds, I'll tell you when, I want you to look at your hand for changes. I want you to look for color changes. And I want you to look if you can see the imprint of your clothing or the chair in your skin. So go ahead and remove your hand and take a look at it. Do you have color changes? Can you see the pattern of your clothing or your chair imprinted in your skin? That was two minutes. Now, can you imagine how deep that imprinting would go in two hours? Can you imagine how deep that imprinting will go in 24 hours? This is a really big deal because over time, I know it's cold in here now, over time that um, as gravity is pulling down on that surface and all of those layers get squished, right? You've got skin and fat and muscle and blood vessels and bone. All of those layers get squished over time, whatever's underneath, whether it's wrinkles in the sheet or the patient's clothing or anything like that, it's that's going to bite up into the skin. So you've got pressure from below on these areas and anything that's not exactly flat is gonna bite up into the skin and it can actually go through the skin. It can actually cause a pressure sore to develop. Pressure sores can develop in as little as 20 minutes if the conditions are right. 20 minutes, it's crazy. So we need to be aware of this. So if I've got a patient who can't move on their own and they're stuck in bed and nobody's in there turning them or, or moving them around, they are going to end up with pressure sores. It's not a maybe, it's a definite because we have gravity and there's no way around it. So if you have a patient with a pressure sore, it is 100%, 100% staff salt, 100%. So if you've got a patient who's immobile and you don't have anything on the care plan about changing position, what would you do with that? Yeah, talk to the nurse. Hey. This guy is moving on his own. 
you want me to be moving them like every two hours? Because remember, sometimes nurses miss things. The phone may have rung. A patient may have had an emergency. We need to work with, not against. Good? Does this make sense? Two minutes, guys, you had imprinting. So if we have a patient, so if we have a patient who cannot move on their own, we're gonna turn them every two hours around the clock. Yes, that means that we are waking them up. We are. And it's horrible, but we have to. Now, I will tell you that there are CNAs who skip overnight turnings because they want the patient to sleep through the night. Don't, don't do your patients any favors because when you're doing that, it's not just the skin that's gonna be affected. It's also respiration and digestion. Sleep is important, yes, absolutely. 100%, I wish my sleep graph reflected that, but it doesn't. Sleep is important, but breathing is just as important. Digestion is just as important. And skin integrity is more important because when you break skin integrity, if you remember, we talked about this on Wednesday, I gave you the tray of HIV, right? So pathogens need a doorway in. And if we have a break in the skin, that makes a beautiful doorway in. Okay. Don't want that. All right, so good, makes sense. How often do we turn patients? Around the clock. That could be a written test question, knowing that. You can actually uh, put a chart like this up in a patient's room if there's not one already there. A lot of times when you have a patient it has to be turned around the clock, you'll see a chart like this that'll tell you, okay, if it's uh, three o'clock, the patient should be on their back. So it'll kind of show you where the patient should be and, and provide a nice little turning clock. Um, but if you don't have one, you can actually make one. The way this works is the patient starts out on their back. Two hours later, they're on their right side. Two hours later, back to their back. Then left side, then back to their back. Right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back. Never on their stomach. Stomach is not on there. If most times, most cases, we don't put patients that are immobile on their stomach, because remember body weight's pulling down, right? Well, if you're on your stomach, that means that you're compressing your lungs and you may not have the nerve innervation or muscle strength to lift you off of your chest cavity to inflate your lungs. And we can accidentally suffocate a patient by laying them on their stomach. Now, there are some conditions where laying on the stomach is good. Like COVID, we found out that if you put a patient with COVID on their stomach, they tend to do better because the, I guess the secretions tend to pull at the front of the lungs and it makes breathing a little bit easier. So there are some conditions where putting them on their stomach is advised. How would we know which is which? Where could we go for that information? The care plan or the nurse, absolutely. So if your care plan doesn't say anything about stomach, that's fine. If the nurse wants the patient on their stomach or what's called prone position, you would see that um, in the care plan, okay? Remember that we don't decide. <laughs> we just follow the rules. All right, so we're gonna turn a patient onto their side, but I'm gonna show you a method that makes this super easy. You can turn someone three times your body size with no stress on you or them. This is really, really cool to, to learn. And it's all about positioning the patient properly before the turn. So I used to work with bariatric patients, patients that were getting ready to go through weight loss surgery, so these are six, 700 pound individuals, most of them were homebound because they, they couldn't, there was no transportation available. And uh, 
I would have to go in and, and physically turn them. Now we're in home care. There's no second person. It's just me. So you really got to know how to do this without injuring you or them. And it was amazing that it was actually really easy to turn somebody that's 600 pounds just by using this technique. So the way it goes is when your patient is laying on their back, the furthest arm is going to go above their head and the closest arm to you crosses their chest. Now, remember, when you turn a patient, we're going to remain behind their behind, right? You guys remember that, right? So when I turn this patient, I'm always turning them away from me. So if I'm turning them on their left side, I would be on the right side of the bed so that when they turn on their left, they're facing away from me. Good. So I would be on the right side of the bed to turn somebody onto their left side. Furthest arm goes up, closest arm goes over. Now, if I were turning them on their right side, I would be on the left side of the bed. Furthest arm goes up, closest arm goes over. Okay, furthest arm up, closest arm over, furthest arm up, closest arm over. Good. So that's how we do the top part of the body. The bottom part of the body, the closest knee is going to be bent with the foot flat on the bed. So I'm bending that knee and putting the foot flat on the bed. The furthest leg is just angled out stays on the bed, but we angle it out. And when you do this, the patient is already half on their side without us really having to work at it. Furthest arm up, closest arm over, closest knee bent, furthest knee angled. And then very simply, you put a hand on the shoulder, one on the hip and roll them the rest of the way. You gotta be careful not to put too much force behind it because you can roll them right off the bed. This is when you set them up like this, the turn becomes effortless because you're moving the parts of the body that um, tend to kind of trail behind to make turning harder. You're moving those first. So then the trunk of the body just turns. Good. Pretty cool. Okay, so here's our checkpoints that we have to remember. Of course, we're always gonna follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening. Every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock, right? We're gonna use a barrier because we have to use pillows and a privacy blanket. We have to have a place to put it. We're gonna decide if we need glove rules or you know, if we need gloves. We, I would want gloves if I was going to touch um, any non-intact skin, body fluids or personal skin. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 68, you'll notice, is it 68? No, sorry, 98, thank you. If you look at the bottom of page 98, you'll notice that this is being done, hmm? yeah, on a live person. So you might be the patient for this and you are fully clothed and holding onto all of your own body fluids like a champ, right? So I'm not gonna be in, in any danger of touching her body fluids or personal skin because she's fully clothed. She has no non-intact skin I have to worry about. So for the test, I probably don't need gloves. Now this patient in the bed is incontinent, dressed in a gown. So do I need gloves for her? Same skill, different patient. Good. So I'm going to decide whether I need gloves. I'm definitely going to use a privacy blanket because my patient is uncovered for this skill in order to get the pillows in the right place. I don't want to hold those pillows and privacy blanket up against my uniform because my uniform is not clean. Okay. I'm going to scoot the patient toward me before I roll them on their side. So you, are you seeing we already know most of this? Okay. Um, we're going to do our closing at the end of the skill, but the skill itself, this is what we're being graded on. These are our checkpoints. We want to scoot the patient toward us. We can ask them to scoot or we can use segments. Furthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses the chest, closest knee is bent with the foot on the bed and the furthest knee is angled out. We're going to roll the patient 
to the middle of the bed, facing away from us. We're gonna put a pillow behind the back. We're gonna put one between the legs and one under the upper arm. We will adjust the pillow under the head and then we'll do our closing. Okay. So that's what we're being graded on here. So it's actually not a long skill. It's one of my favorites. This one, I, because you, you're gonna make somebody super comfortable. They're not gonna wanna get out of bed after this. <laughs> this is like super comfortable. Um, this skill, it tells you somebody with your level of ability, your level of knowledge, should be able to complete this skill in eight minutes or less. So it's not a particularly long skill either. Okay, good. Now I am gonna show you the um, video for this because it's got good close-ups of the pillow. The back pillow is the hard one. I actually make it look easy. It's not as easy as it looks on the video. That back pillow is tough. We're gonna tuck that pillow down under the back and then we're gonna roll it and tuck the second edge under the back as well. It has to maintain a roll behind the patient in order to get credit for it. That one is not easy. And if I do this skill here live in front of you, you can't really see that pillow very well. And that's why I want you to watch the video. Video has good close-ups. You'll see this whole video is five minutes, and that includes all of this stuff. Very easy to do. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. Let me turn you up to the left side. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close the curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll start gathering your supplies. We'll start with a barrier, which I'll place on the table to provide a clean area to place my supplies. And I'll Get three pillows from clean supply cabinet. Nature will not allow them to touch my uniform. Put your guns into a place of blanket over you, and this will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. Once I have the blanket in place, and I'll pull the sheet down underneath the blanket, making sure the patient remains covered at all times. Okay, Mr. Jones, if I can have you scooch toward me, please. I'm going to place your furthest arm above your head and cross your closest arm over your chest. I'm going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm going to angle the furthest knee out a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to turn you onto your side. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to take the first pillow and put it in an angle up against the back. And I'm gonna tuck this top edge underneath the patient by pushing down on the pillow and under his back. 
this edge will roll up and then it too will be pushed down and under, forming a roll along the back. Okay, now I'm going to position a pillow between the two legs by lifting the top leg and laying the pillow lengthwise between the two legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles to prevent those bony areas from rubbing together. This pillow is going to be placed underneath the upper arm. This will help keep the arm in a neutral position as the patient remains on their side. And then I'm going to adjust the pillow underneath the head to make sure that it's not under the shoulder and it remains only under the head and the neck. And then move the arm to a more comfortable position. Is that comfortable, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay, I'm going to place the pillow directly in your hand. Are you comfortable? Yes. Can I get you anything else while I'm in here? No. Okay, let me pull your sheet up. And remove the privacy control. Be careful not to dislodge all of those pillows as I do so. I'll roll the privacy blanket up and place it in during length. Barrier will be thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to open your privacy curtain now. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Let me go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, any questions on that one? Any questions? That's why you got to be tired. <laughs> What's that? That's why you got to be tired. That's yeah, the, the pillow behind the back can be a bit tricky. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take our break. Um, come back at 10 till. I'll give you 17 minutes for break. Come back at 10 till. I'm going to do it. Okay. She said she was going to check the front desk. Okay. Thank you. 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 <laughs> and there's no closer place to go to like buy something to eat. Um, 
Okay, if you go uh, that way, there's McDonald's to the left. Uh, there we go. And, and if you go further down, there's uh, Pepper Street, there's a. Uh, um, huh? Oh, not, not for the time we have. Oh, no, you can't go anywhere. You're not going to be able to get anything. Now. Oh, your friend is, huh? your friend is trying to convince you to Um, yeah, she, she did a lot of illegal stuff and she got away with it. And it's bad. That's one of the main reasons I don't speak to her anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's quite important. Because her son is. She just went online and took these courses and did some of that. Yeah. Yeah. You usually yeah. can do that kind of work yeah. because you yeah. have to uh, yeah. have a degree. Or you can move that somewhere that you know that has a degree. Yeah. 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 But there's such a need for people, yeah, you know, to take care of the kids that they basically do not have to do that as a little kind of skinny without having that. Yeah, I think her teeth are both the because there are so many people that can make a lot of money anywhere, but the cost of living is outrageous. A couple of this, so that's the reason I totally agree. You have to work there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's why I couldn't say it over there. Anyway, but you have to say, um, with the politics that's going on in the world, it's everywhere because while you guys were here and not, um, running around like nothing is happening, I was restricted in the pandemic. Couldn't go out. There was no food in the places. You know, at one point, you know, where that was in New York. You know, when during the pandemic, you couldn't go out certain times. You had to get. Yeah, that's why I can't in New York. I've heard it was rough in New York. It was. Believe me. Some for weeks, just like every place was shut down. You couldn't yeah. even get personal supplies. Mm. Uh, no disinfectant. Even water, something simpler than water, you can get. I was one of the first because I was so nervous wearing masks and all of that. In the, you know, when it first started out, mm -hmm. and people were looking like, you know, they didn't take it seriously right away. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm so used to, um, you know, uh, the Chinese people in New York. They, you know, they're used to wearing. Yeah, China. Yeah. So that was growing up. I would see them wearing that all the time. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? Why are they wearing that? Oh, you're in New York. Oh, yeah. So even then, and before COVID, I was, you know, I'm very, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. my kids come home right away, drop your bag, wash your hands. I don't care. Go, you take your clothes off, put it in the room to be clean. You change. Then you come to the table with you, you know, Whatever you wear outside, and I'm still that way. I wear this outside. I'm not sitting in my house with this. I don't know who sat here. I don't know what they have. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, going into this, I'm like doing everything that I did there. Mm -hmm. Opposite. I wouldn't, you know, I'm very, um, I have a lot of phobias about touching people and mm -hmm. smelling people and all of that. And now I'm like, okay. You know, my whole life changed, so I have to just go full throttle. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do this. I'm just trying. Nice, though. Yeah, because when it comes to scent, good or bad, I can't handle it. When I was in Jamaica, I was a girl, and because that level was in Jamaica, it was very bad. Most of the time, it's right in my car. They were staying there at home. I go there, take care of them. When they had to go to the doctor, they come in, take them to the doctor. Mm -hmm. They come in, they give her the medication, and mm -hmm. that's it. And I'm just feeling well. Yeah. And they were like, why didn't you go to the medical school? Yeah. 
But I just have a tap and I have to look in after the whole yeah. cell and it's not really you, you you part of me I love. Yeah. But my heart yeah. just goes with them. Yeah, you you have to have and compassion. And I just try to look after them. Yeah, I used to look after a lady. She was just 60 something. She wasn't too much. She put me skin down on her. Mm-hmm. And she used to wear the diapers. And when I got there, she said, I want to go to the bathroom. I said, why I don't have one the diaper? She said, no, my kids will kill me if I go in the diaper. I said, but why they put it on you? Because they're concerned because about themselves. And you not, can't. Like she said, not yeah. paying attention to yeah. you're still a human I being. said, you can't go to the bathroom because they made the bathroom for her to step. You have to step down. I said, mm-hmm. you are not in the position to go to the bathroom. Yeah, so that's dangerous. What are you going to do? She said, I can't do it in the diaper. I said, do it. That, that is what I'm here for. I will take it off you. Mm-hmm. That's where, when, when I'm going home in the evening, mm-hmm. she wrote me, she said, everything near to her, close to her. She said, give me a little piece of bun. Give me a little bottle of water. She wrote me, put everything the time around her because she said, when I'm gone, yeah, she's I'm afraid. not going to be looked after and mm-hmm. then you come back tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. My kids are gonna say I'm miserable, and my kids are gonna say I'm this, and my kids are gonna mm-hmm. say I'm that. And, it, and it's true, you see, when I go in the morning, you have my daughter there, and the daughter would be just crying, 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 crying. I said, What happened to her? No, you don't want me to change the diaper, I have to go to work. I'm late for work, and she just don't want me to do anything. And she just and she complained everything. And when I go into the morning, I said, we didn't make everything there. This is there. Why that stay in it? I take it out, pull it out. Then do it and go make up again. So I just, I just wait and see how you. She had strokes on one side. And when I went there first, you know, you know I wasn't working with her. I, it was just my friend and I went to meet her at it one day. And when I went there, the daughter took some ripe planting because she knew something small. She cut them, but she didn't cut them small enough. And she just put the plate in front of her and said, here, eat. And if they had a hand, couldn't manage. Yeah. And I was looking at them like this. And I just take up the plate. And I start eating her. And she said, thank you. They were in the circle, you know. And when she died, they were okay. Oh, I miss my mom. I miss her. Up to the other day, I was looking at the plate with in a spot. Oh, I miss my mom. I miss my mom. It's seven years now. I didn't even realize it. I said, it's seven years now since my mom died. I don't know how things are them. If I didn't go there, the mom, you know how I get the job here? I, every morning, my daughter step out to go to school. I step out with her. I don't even do anything in my house. I just say, I'm going to look at her. And when I go there, she said, I'm glad you come. Everybody is gone. Give, give me some hot water. Give me this. Give me that. And I started helping her. And her son came there one day and she whispered to the son here because they, every time the sons came, they would surround her. So they couldn't know what was going on. They would come and see her clean. And they thought it was the girls looking at her. Okay? So they didn't know that it was me who leave my house and come look after her. So she was, every time they come in now, the, the guys come in to look, the daughter would sit around because they don't want the, 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 the mother to tell the, the guys that they are not the one. So one day she said, they come in and she still want to lift her up. And he lift her out of the bed and he, he went to, 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 to his ears and said, Mom, yeah. looking after me. Oh, and the guy yeah. asked them, who is looking after him? So, Miss Arlene up the road. And they came back to me. And I said, you looking after my mommy? And he said, who told her that? He said, my mom told us that the girls are not looking after them. You are the one looking. And they gave me the job. So oh, when yeah. they gave me a job, I said to them, said, go and have the daughters first because I don't want them to say they are there and you give me, you guys give me the work. You see, when they go to the daughters, they say, let me do it. I am tired. I am busy. Oh, we have a lot of compassion. Yeah. And I did a lot, a lot. Even when I was coming to America here, I live a pastor, and I look after the wife and the wife died, and the pastor cried. He said, he's not going to get anybody to take care of them right so I did. Mm-hmm. So, so you're going to go full into nursing? Or you start- I don't know. I just try. Well, you have the right attitude, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. You know? you care about the rest so that's all we need, you know? Yeah. The rest will come. Mm-hmm. 
I'm hoping. <laughs> I care about people. Yeah. I like to help people. I just gotta be yeah. brave to, you know. I can find this song. You see, you see, um, like the the doors, bed doors, mm -hmm. the pool, everything. I'm not afraid of nothing. Yeah. I just call up. I went to the doctor. There was um a man who was from England. I came back with a teenager and he had um Parkinson. The wife said she called the doctor because she didn't like how he was taking. And she called the doctor and what is it that the doctor the doctor gave the man? She don't know what was. And he was bedridden. And she said this place for two weeks he had bed to. Of course. And and then, you know, you know yeah. that is no, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, yeah. the face, you know, man, mm -hmm. they run. He has yeah, a person there. Yeah. And it yeah. looks like when you cut meat, yeah. if you look at yeah. it, if you are not seeing them, like you, you don't yeah. have meat. Well, and that's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> when I went there, the day she said, okay, I like to head in him like six in the evening. We do it. In the morning, we do it in the midday. We don't make him dirty. That's because mm -hmm. when she was very hard, I want to mm -hmm. let the poo contaminate the, the dish of course, yeah. Because she was working in an hospital in England, so she had an idea. But she said she just needed help. Mm -hmm. When I went in the evening, I went cheap and tiny time. I want to get everything together. And she tell me what to do. When she take the, 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 the diaper half and remove the bandages, you know, she said she thought I'd run. <laughs> I've never seen bed squares like this before. And I looked like this. He said, Whoa, you have bed squares. He said, You're not running. I said, Why? She said, Everybody has seen their run. Oh, not everyone has. <laughs> you know, yeah. When my yeah. my parents mm -hmm. were, were shot down in life, and with my mother, I couldn't even, I'm ashamed to say, I couldn't even the stomach the scent of, mm -hmm. you know. It's hard to run. Yeah. Oh, all right. I couldn't do it with my mom, and she made me promise. That I would be a nurse. I'm like, Mom, you're asking no. <laughs> so much of me. Mm -hmm. And that was about 13 years ago. I, I've still been trying to deal with sex. And I don't know if yeah. I'll be able to. Do they give a lot of because you said the pastor and I'm that I used to look after. Mm -hmm. When I go in the morning, you know, the whole house, if you're not making up, because she walks away when you put on a day up on her, she gets up in the night and she takes them off. Yeah, because and then she tried yeah. to put on her clothes. Yeah, yeah, she tried to put on her clothes. Sometimes you put um, a little oil. Yeah. You, oh. You're highly very So you breathe in peppermint or something. Yeah. Oil or something other than good or bad sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you look around the house, mm -hmm. diaper, then she changes like the hand of weird. When she put them on, she put on two white ones. So as soon as they got ready, she just take them off and throw them not on her. And she put that by the time I go down there in the morning, or 10, and the weird, just oh, lying wow. there, plus the diapers. I have to call her. Everybody she, everybody running from her now. They can't manage this, and they don't know what to do. They don't sleep. She's just all about the house. Oh, time I is, this, down, is this a man? A woman. But she's taking care of a man? No, she was taking she care was, of her. I was oh, okay. taking care of her. Because they have external mm -hmm. well, they husband Yeah, there's there. external catheters. Yeah. So it's just a condom you put on that drains. So you're not changing the, the diaper. She yeah. had a pile and she didn't cut it. She hid it. And it becomes cancer. It becomes a big piece of flesh oh, in the rectum. Oh, have you ever yeah. seen that? A big piece oh, of oh, red flesh okay. in the red tongue. Like a hemorrhoid, yeah. Yes, an hemorrhoid too. So she it drains. Oh, oh, okay. so, now. so I have to keep dressing it with the cotton mm -hmm. when I'm there in the day. Like, I know what to do. Mm -hmm. But when I'm gone in the night, that is when I the problem drink, is. Uh, I so when I stop come drinking so much on the heat. So when I come in in the morning, just a lot of work to do. Yeah. Sometimes you have to like 12 sheets. To be washed and all those things. And when they put her and put her in the bath in the house, because they used to be there in the forward and they said, she don't want to bed, she's not. I said, no. Yeah. She said, when they do come this way, they need to warm the water. Yeah. If you come and go there and start to warm the water, they die. When, when I'm showering her, she said, let me wash here. And I would shower her and then I give her the other. I said, you wash me. Yeah. And she was sitting there. She said, 
We do learn these things. Aren't you nice? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Mm, she keeps on asking. So who you do so good? I said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just said, I, the girl, she never used to come to here. When I come to her, her church, she members then come and I see it. And she said, my God, how did you come to here? I didn't know she could hear from us here. <laughs> <laughs> well, she would just sit down and let me do everything with her. Mm. The fact that we just look at me like if you say, my God, who did you learn these things? I said, no. <laughs> You just pick on that mm-hmm. one. Yeah, I heard it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I pulled the wall quickly. It says, Where's my pen? Where's my pen? Where's my pen? That's what I said. It says, You have to see. When you see, I'll see what you do. Just keep on doing and I'll see your eyes. I'll do. Mm-hmm. And it made it 10 minutes and I said, Yes, I have to see. She said, I'm going to see it now. <laughs> we have to coach them. We have to spread them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I still have to text them. Hey, you have children? Huh? How many children do you have? Uh-huh. And then they say, Don't you used to look up to them like you look up to me? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I'm saying, Brooks, you're, you're, you're too good to let your friends say, Oh, okay, I can't tell us to tell you to get two kids and two brothers. I say, You need a little more. Take them up and get them. <laughs> okay. And then you're friend them and you show them up. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. What do I do to them? But I didn't go anywhere to learn anything. I didn't have the um, I was going to tell you. As a matter of fact, I tell everybody, you can get, we have CNA in some places, and they will pay for your education for you. Yeah. 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 Some of them will. Some of them won't. But some of them will. You need to find out where that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When, when I'm in Jamaica, I will say. Well, we're going to bring a I'm just going to help you. What are you going to do that? Or are you going to leave it? Me, no. I'm just telling myself. Mm-hmm. I, I, I passed the age. Yeah. If I was younger. I'm in nothing. I'm looking at retiring. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to retire right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just would like to just read for, you know, to get yeah. my pay, but. I wouldn't rather do the nursing thing I think. But I'll do the same. Yeah. Um, and they told me it would be best for you to talk to because they told me that they know that I'm not computer literate and um, I would not be able to help you. <laughs> what is over? I'm not good on computers. Yeah. So if it was something you needed to click or something like that, or they explained it to me, it would get lost in the translation. No, I didn't know that before. No, I don't know. Are you mm-hmm. on the computer? This is right down the road. You, did yeah. you go by where they're at? Me. If you told me, yeah. I wonder if I could go down there. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would say go down and she can show you. It's, um, okay. This Sorry, it's old. Did you see? Yeah. Where are you with your room? This is my um, queen. I live in Queens for a little bit, and then I live in Long Island. And here's that light. That's We're Philly. 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 Oh. How are you? Uh, Melbourne. Uh huh. Melbourne area of Texas. And I think it's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, I know very bad. I was like the fourth of. Probably went to twice. Yeah. But um, I I did. It work as a little healthy, but it was more healthy, and you can see like a right on the um, road is and they're trying to find something like a place to live or, with salary well, there. They do, yeah, yeah. So I can so, stay. Yeah, they make a lot of money, but the uh, cost of uh, housing oh, okay. is okay. so don't break it. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and it's just gonna get well. I, I did that last year. Mm-hmm. Well, Anyway, so it's right next to the little love to stay in right front of the stores. And it's just that really good. Yeah. I'm going to roll that out. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. 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 working yeah. just yeah. to pay my bills, oh. to maintain my house. Oh. Like, like, so you go to the fourth oak just so that. But even now, it's in Florida. Florida. And the house so prices just, uh, are doubled. You know, okay. I've been there for about seven months, and it's it's it ridiculous. It is like you said, it's something they exist. Most of the to stay too late right now. In yeah. the house. So it's like you know, oh, like you know, so you're saying you're living in your home. So it's it's 
crazy. I don't know how long we need to do that. Because it would be there to keep a whole lot of time. Yeah. 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 With her, I think some people don't work. Yeah, I, mean, I guess you guys all work. With her, what? The first one very nice to get, but I'm not going to see you again. Huh? I don't think I want to see you again. The first one very nice to get. Three guys on. Yeah. And then one was sitting there. The first? No, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh you mean, oh, I'm sorry. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was another lady there. Mm -hmm. She was there. Oh, there were 10. There were 10 of us. Yeah. And then she came in and did 11. The one that yesterday, I, I think she works with her. She yes. Works. Mm -hmm. I don't have this. This yeah, is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I believe there were uh, I think six, nine of us. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the first party, why? The first party was with us, and then you were in the middle. The first party, yeah, it was ten of us. Ten of us. Yeah. It was a party. Oh, so if you have something at you're gonna sell old and why you can't you know you have made zero zero taking the plus and putting money to it here. So it's just it just adds one up and says twenty four. Then it's like zero. Okay, but you then you still was answering my question. I have so answers. Is, um, like you said, I don't know if they're right, but I have answers. <laughs> so, um, I should have, um, I've got a little bit of a replacement for the job. We, it's funny that you say that. We, um, I'm meeting on Friday with a local employer that is looking to come in and recruit. I have three home care agencies that want to come in on the last day. I have a whole bunch of employers there. So that's kind of our employer um, corner. If I let everybody in that wants to come in and recruit from the classroom, we won't get anything done. So I have to be very, very selective um, just because of time. But if you go to my website for your CNA.com, under after certification. So, you know, I've got the menu at the top. Under after certification, the very first link there says local jobs. If you click on that, I have a listing of all of the um, CNA employers in the county. It's all categorized, like, you know, hospitals, nursing homes, ALFs, doctor's offices, other, that type of thing. All of them are there. If you click on their name, so let's say Timber Pines across the street, you click on that, it goes to their website, the, the hiring page on their website. So you can fill out, I've done all the work for you. So, but they, everybody is hiring. And see, that's the problem. Everybody is hiring. So if I let, you know, one person come in, then I've got another one that says, well, why couldn't we come in? And now I would end up doing an entire jobs fair on the last day of class because they all want to. So I did that more as a compromise. You know, they're able to drop off, you know, literature and um, I'll be happy to pass it out, but I'm maintaining that jobs page so that I think I have to change the link for um, Timber Pines. So they did call me. Yes, the 15th. Oh, okay. All right. 
Um, make sure that you, you'll have a graduation folder here. When you come pick it up, make sure you bring your textbook back if you're not going to be here that day, okay? Well, you're going to register for the exam whenever you want. So you don't give me the applications. You're going to register independently. You should be testing about two to three weeks after um, you register. So that would put it about a week or two after graduation. We're just coming into, you guys are still okay. The next class will have a problem. You guys should still be okay. But in April, May, June, that's what we call season. Um, for testing because all of the high schools are graduating and testing, all of the colleges are graduating and testing, a lot of the vocational schools that run on semesters are testing. So in the spring is like the testing volume triples overnight. So from mid-April through June, the, the, there is a bit of a delay in testing. You guys should be okay. You should be testing about a week or two after graduation. Yeah, if you register today, when I give you the registration packet, you'll be testing in, in general about a week after graduation or so. Um, I just heard, uh, got an email from one of my current students from the last class and she passed both sections, no problem. Um, so she tested Monday, I think it was. And she told me she got, she texted me yesterday, said that she had passed those sections. So um, that, that's that been about three weeks since she graduated. So, you know, right in that time. And I don't know when she registered, but. Oh, yeah. 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 You guys are way more prepared than. And part of the problem is, and I understand how this works, but part of the problem is you watch me do these skills and then you try them and you're fumbling all over the place and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not ready for this. They're not judging you against me. That's not fair. They're judging you against other yous. So you have to kind of get that mindset. It doesn't have to be perfect. Remember, I've been doing this for like 30 years, guys. You know, I can't make it look hard. I can't. So you have to be careful not to get that mindset that it has to look just like how I make it look because it's not really how you're being judged. Now, on the other hand, if I came up here and just kind of, um, you know, messed up all the way through it, you would have zero confidence in my teaching ability. So I have to make it look smooth right? And, and look professional, but remember that that's not how you're judged, okay? When you're going into the test, can you have to wear this clothes? You don't have to. You can test in um, civilian clothes. There's no dress code requirement for testing, except that you have to have closed-toed shoes. That's the only dress code required. So you can't wear sandals or flip-flops or anything like that. It has to be a closed-toed shoe. Other than that, they don't care. I've seen, when we were a testing center, I saw people come in and cut off shirt or shorts and take tops to test. Now, I personally wouldn't recommend that. I think that there is something to look the part, act the part. And regardless of whether they're supposed to judge you, I think that subconsciously, if you come not dressed appropriately for a, a, a medical exam, I think that that will, yeah, I think that it will have an indirect effect on your score. I, I can't see how it wouldn't, you know, and, and they, they probably work hard not to allow that to happen, but psychologically, they are going to judge on your appearance. I mean, it's just, we do. As humans, we do judge others on appearance. It's completely subconscious. So, yeah, um, you don't have to, but I, I, I would recommend it. Yeah, I think you'll perform better. All right. So any questions on supported sideline position? No? All right. Go to page 84 for me, please.
this is our um, page 84. At the top of the page, you can see our care plan. It says provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. The resident is sitting in a chair and their sock and shoe should be replaced at the end of the scale. Now, let me explain why that's in there. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this is gonna be done on another live testing student. So you might be the patient for foot care. You probably don't have an extra pair of socks in your back pocket, right? We don't normally walk around with an extra pair of socks somewhere. So they know that for the test, if you are a patient for this, there are no other socks to put on. That's why this says this in the, in the care plan for the test. It's telling you, put the sock and shoe back on that they started with. Because otherwise, people during the test are, you know, trying to figure out, well, what do I do now? It's a clean foot. I don't want to put a clean sock or this dirty sock back on a clean foot. And it causes a lot of confusion. And that's why it's on here to give you clear direction. Okay, does that make sense? All right, but the skill itself is easy. Provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. That's it, I mean, that, that, there's not much here. So our washing rules are going to apply. Whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. We wanna make sure that we, when we get water, we check it. What temperature should it be? Warm, who else has to check it? the patient. We're not going to put soap in the, okay, because we have to have it for rinsing, right? So all of those rules still apply. There's nothing really new to learn here. Now, this is like hand and nail care. Remember hand and nail care? We put the hand in the basin of soap, took it out to wash, let it rest on a, a towel, put it back into rinse, took it out to dry. You guys remember all that? And then with hand care, we clean the nails and file the edges. We don't do that with feet. We don't do anything with toenails, nothing with toenails. We don't trim them, we don't clean them, we don't file them, we don't do anything with toenails other than look at them. <laughs> that is our job is to look at the toenails. If we notice that they need a little bit of care, we let the nurse know. And most facilities have a podiatrist comes into the facility. But that podiatrist does not go room to room do you need me? Do you need me? They don't do that. They go in, they look at a list. If the patient's on the list, they get seen. If they're not on the list, they're out of luck. So the way this works is that the care plan is written. You do foot care. You look at the feet. Do we need any other thing addressed? If, they, if the patient does, you tell the nurse. The nurse puts them on the list. The podiatrist sees them and everything is fine. So you do not clean toenails, you do not trim toenails, you do not file toenails, but you do look at toenails. So for this skill, the whole purpose behind this is to look at the foot. It's not about cleaning. The cleaning is the reason you're looking at the foot. It gives you an excuse to be there, but that's not why we're doing this. Now, in order to understand that, I have to teach you a little bit about diabetes because that's really why why we're doing this so we're going to learn again fifth grade version of diabetes diabetes is way way more complex than I'm, what i'm about to show you i really really um sorry my assistant is telling me that there's an interruption okay um I want to make sure I'm still streaming here. So diabetes is way more complex than what I'm about to explain to you. Okay, so we're going to take about 15, 20 minutes to understand a general overview. So like I said, this is a lot, hand and nail care and foot care are a lot alike. Remember that we supported the wrist. Here we're going to support the foot. We're going to soak the hand in water. We're going to soak the foot in water. There's a lot of wash, rinse, dry. There's a lot of similarities here. The biggest difference is we're not going to clean the nails and we're not going to put lotion between the toes because we don't want to hold moisture there, warm, dark, moist, right? But other than that, the two are very, very similar. So we're going to come back here in just a second, but I want to diabetes and I want to explain what this is. So now, 
every cell in your body needs fuel to run, every cell. And the fuel it likes is sugar. That's what cells like to run on. That's the preferred fuel. Now, luckily for us, we eat a lot of sugar because every carbohydrate you eat breaks down in your body into sugar. That sugar then fuels the cells. The cells are happy. Everybody's in good shape, right? So that's what we prefer. So your cells get hungry. You take carbs. Those carbs break down into sugar and the sugar then fuels the cell. Now, that's not the only fuel that cells can use. Cells can use other fuel as well, but sugar is kind of the preferred. Now, the problem is that every cell has a door. That door is locked. So just eating carbs, which break down into sugar, is only half the story. The carbs break down into sugar that goes into your bloodstream, but it doesn't necessarily enter the cells because it's got to get through that locked door. So what we need is a key. So when you take in carbs and it breaks down into sugar, that turns the brain and it says, hey, we need some keys to open up doors. You have a little organ called a pancreas that produces keys. Its real name is insulin, but all insulin is, is a key that opens the door to the cells. That's it, that, that's the system. So you eat carbs, they break down into sugar, the brain tells the pancreas, we need some keys. The pancreas produces insulin. Insulin unlocks the cell. The sugar goes in. Okay, so good? Good. So here's a graphic that explains that. The cell is hungry. Sugar goes into the bloodstream. Insulin unlocks the door. Sugar goes into the cell. And the cell is now fed and happy. The problem here is when you have diabetes, there's not a problem here and there's not a problem here. Your problem comes in one of these two places, okay? And I'm gonna explain that. But the end result, this is important, the end result is if we have starving cells and we can't get fuel inside the cells, the cells continue starving. What happens when you starve for too long? You die. So with diabetes, there can be cell death because the cells are not getting proper nourishment. Doesn't sound like a good thing to me. I think I need all the cells I've got. They all do something specific. I can't afford to go losing any. And that's what happens here with diabetes. So when we have a patient with diabetes and we don't have insulin, which is that key that we need, what happens is the cells are starving. We eat carbs, it produces sugar. The sugar goes into the bloodstream, but it can't get into the cell. So we end up with a whole lot of sugar and starving cells. So there's where our high blood sugar comes in. Because the sugar can't enter the cells, it's, it's got to go somewhere. Now, the issue is that sugar can't really be excreted very well. So it just circulates around and around and around and around and around and around, has nowhere to go because we can't really excrete it effectively. So when you have an arterial system, and this is the artery system of your body, right? When you have this arterial system and blood sugar is just circulating around and around because it, it can't get into the cells, it has nowhere to go, and we can't really excrete it, it's going to have some very specific effects in the body, some very specific effects. Have you ever had like a cake or a cupcake that's been left out on the counter for a couple of days? What happens to the frosting? Yeah, it gets dry. So it kind of separates, right? We get some crystals and we get some oil, but it kind of separates, right? Well, the crystals are kind of crunchy. Well, that is what is in the inside of your arteries if that sugar can't get into the cells. So we have these crystals that are circulating. Well, on planet Earth, we have gravity. 
So that's gonna, crystals are heavy. That's gonna pull the crystals down to the lowest points of the body. Well, what's the lowest point of my lower body? Feet. What's the lowest point of my upper body? Hand, hand and nail care, foot care, guys. This is why we do it. Because these crystals are being pulled down to those areas, you're gonna have more effects in the hands and the feet with diabetic patients. And this is why you have to be looking at those areas. Make sense? Okay. But this is what a crystal looks like. See how it's nice and jagged, right? Lots and lots and lots. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Lots of sharp, sharp surfaces. So this is on the inside of your arteries and it's circulating on the inside of your arteries. So as it lands on the inside of your arteries, it's going to make those arteries very stiff. And because you've got all these jagged edges sticking up, it's gonna catch things that are floating by. Things like cholesterol, which looks like pizza cheese on the inside of your arteries. It's gonna shred cells. Remember, I can't afford to get rid of my cells. I need them all. So you end up with this big gloopy mess on the inside of your arteries. Make sense? Yeah, not good. So even though, even though, this goes back into chapter four, this is an endocrine disease. Our pancreas is not producing insulin. Pancreas doesn't make keys. It's having a huge effect on the cardiovascular system, but it doesn't stop there. Those crystals are also going to, to coat the nerves. So what happens here is that see, our body, are, we're not wireless. <laughs> I love this idea of wireless, things going through the air. Our body is not built like that. We are actually hardwired. There is a physical line that goes from my brain to my big toe. There is a nerve that connects the two, a physical line that connects the two. Well, if that line gets all corroded with these crystals, then I can stub my toe and my toe can have an injury, but it can't get the message to the brain. So my toe knows there's a problem, but my brain, totally clueless. No idea that there's a problem there. And that's because of the buildup of sugar, unregulated sugar, circulating, 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 nowhere to go, has to land somewhere. And that unregulated sugar can actually affect the nerves in the body. So we have an endocrine problem, right? Pancreas isn't working, no keys, but it's affecting our arterial system and our nervous system. It affects lots of other systems too, but we're just gonna stick with these two for right now. Do you see how all of these systems are intertwined? Okay, oops. All right, this didn't have, I'm missing a slide. All right, so let me explain to you why this is a bad thing. Capital B, bad thing. All right, so, when we are brand new in the world, we get brand new arteries. <laughs> and your arteries kind of look like this when you're first starting out. Nice and wide open, able to um, expand and contract as needed. Man, that's a nice artery. I would love my artery to look like that. It does not. <laughs> because in America, our diet is very carb heavy. Now, that's not a bad thing. Carbs get a bad rap. They really do, but they're not bad things. Remember, every cell in your body needs sugar to run, right? So this isn't a bad thing. The problem is that we go overboard with carbs and anything that you don't use, remember, we can't excrete. So we got to do something with it. Well, we happen to come with a whole bunch of storage units built right in. So if you've paid attention in Spring Hill, you'll see that we have a storage unit going up on every corner now. I don't understand it. I don't know how this many people have this much stuff to store, but apparently somebody knows something I don't. But there is a ton of storage units out there. They're building more every day. 
Well, our body has the same thing. So when you take in carbs and they break down into sugar and your body releases insulin, your cells are going to use whatever they need of that sugar. Anything extra is going to be packed away into a storage unit called a fat cell. And they're stored as glycogen. So we put them in these nice, neat little boxes and we put them in a storage unit. The next day we eat more carbs. We don't use them all. So some of that gets packed up as glycogen and put in storage. And the next day we pack up more and put it in storage. Now, if you've ever put anything in storage and gone back to it like 20 years later, you start to realize that that stuff is old and outdated and I really don't want that anymore. Why was I storing it all this time? I'm not ever gonna use this and you tend to throw it away. Well, the same thing happens with glycogen. When you put glycogen in a storage unit, a fat cell, and you try to go back to it 20 years later, it's not as effective. It's not aged well. And it's harder to get rid of. So when we have an excessive fat buildup, it's harder to burn that as fuel because it just doesn't burn as effectively. It's old, outdated. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So in America, this starts really early. We have a three-year-old child that gets up at six o'clock in the morning. And mom's like, oh, it's way too early for me. I don't want to do this. Hands the child a Pop-Tart, sits him in front of the TV to watch Bluey or whatever the cartoon of the month is. And mom naps on the couch and the kid eats the Pop-Tart, stays out of trouble. And mom gets up about 7.30 and off the couch and says, okay, I'll make you some breakfast now. What do you want? So kids don't eat Raisin Bran and shredded wheat. What do they eat? Oh, the sugary cereals, the ones that taste good, right? Fruity Pebbles, Fruit Loops, right? All the Captain Crunch, all those sugary cereals. Now, that Pop-Tart was carbs. Those carbs broke down into sugar in the body. That sugar circulated and the pancreas had to produce insulin so the body could use that sugar. So our pancreas has already been working this morning. So we eat fruity pebbles now at 7.30, and that breaks down into sugar in the body. The pancreas has to produce insulin to take care of that sugar to get it into the cells. And um, so our pancreas is working a little harder. Now, mid-morning, child needs a snack. Good mom. Mom gives the child fruit as a snack, watermelon, strawberries, fruit. But fruit breaks down into sugar Sugar requires insulin, which means our pancreas is working hard again. Lunchtime, the national toddler diet of mac and cheese and chicken nuggets, and those are carbs, which breaks down into sugar, and the pancreas has to produce insulin. So our pancreas is still working. Mid-afternoon snack is always like a little Debbie snack cake or something like that. Those are carbs. They break down into sugar, which makes your pancreas produce insulin. Dinner, mom makes spaghetti and salad. The kid eats spaghetti, but not the salad. And the spaghetti is carbs that breaks down into sugar that causes the pancreas to produce insulin. So we start out from a very early age overusing our pancreas. Now we become adolescents and we decide that we truly can live on pizza and French fries. <laughs> and those are all carbs that break down into sugar that make your pancreas produce insulin. Now, as we get into our twenties, become a little more health conscious and start working more health foods in, but the vast majority of people are on a grab and go system because now you probably have kids of your own, life is busy and you're just trying to get through the next day. So you're probably eating a very carb heavy diet because carbs are cheap, easily accessible and affordable. So our diet tends to consist of mainly carbohydrates. 
which when you look at this from a lifestyle perspective, a lifelong perspective, means that you're making your pancreas overwork from the time you're about three until you get into your 60s. And all of a sudden, you end up with diabetes. And you're looking at the doctor going, well, I've never had a blood sugar problem in my life. Where did this come from? Well, it came because at three, you ate pop and fruity pebble, little days, and, and you kept that up throughout your lifespan. So now we're at a point that your body is starting to wind down. You're in your 60s. Your pancreas is already fried because you've overused it. It's just simply given up. Done. This did not happen overnight. This happened because of a lifetime of dietary habits that caused us to overuse the, overuse the pancreas. Does that make sense? But if you remember, I told you, let me go back one here. If you remember, I told you the um, cells can run on other fuel. They don't like it as much. Sugar is preferred, but it can run on other fuel. Now the other fuel is protein. And there's a little tiny back door on the back of the cells that you can't see here, a little tiny back door that protein can enter. And the cells can run on protein, which is awesome. Um, and that's very, very helpful, especially if we don't have access to good sugar. So what ends up happening though, is that when sugar can't be used, because our pancreas isn't producing insulin and we got all this sugar buildup, the cells are still starving and they're dying and they're yelling at the brain, we are dying, do something. So the body will actually start, okay, well, if we have no sugar, if we can't get sugar in, let's try protein and it'll start breaking down your muscles because protein is not stored in fat it'll start breaking down your muscles and utilizing that for fuel instead. And that is a very, very bad idea because you can break down fat cells and be just fine. When you start breaking down muscle, you lose muscle mass, you lose strength, and it produces a byproduct that actually over time can be toxic. So not a good idea. This is how most diabetes diabetic patients get um, diagnosed actually, is they start losing muscle mass and they go to the doctor. It also produces um, extreme hunger. Now, the reason that you get hungry is because your cell is screaming, I'm starving. And it's not one cell, it's not two cells. It's entire body of cells yelling at the brain, we are dying, do something, anything. So your patient gets very, very hungry. And most diabetics will get hungry for sugar. Yeah, don't get mad at your diabetic patients for craving sugar and eating a donut. They're trying to keep their cells from dying. That's the only thing that the brain knows how to do. So when you have a patient who is chowing down on a donut and they're diabetic, don't yell at them. They're re reacting to a very real threat in their body. Their cells are literally dying at the moment. The problem is that donut is going to do nothing to help them. It's just going to throw more sugar in that it's going to build up. It's not going to help at all, but they don't know that. So remember I said there's a back door, right? What does the back door run on? Protein. So if you've got a diabetic patient that's chowing down on a donut, try to get them to eat some protein with it. So a slice of cheese and an apple, peanut butter crackers, tuna fish sandwich. So that carbs will help crave the, or uh, help stop the cravings. The protein will help fuel the cells. A good rule of thumb for you guys, because you have probably led a very carbs centric diet in your lifetime, a good, um, piece of advice for you is to eat half as many grams protein as you are carbs. If you can keep a two to one ratio, you actually will help balance this system. 
So if you're going to eat that, you know, fry from the drive-through down the road, you probably want to make sure that you're balancing it with protein. So, you know, a hamburger or a chicken, but you have to remember that that's on a, and which is more carbs. So if you really want that meal, you're going to have to increase your fries <laughs> to keep that ratio or take the bun off. Very good. Yep. But if you start to become a little bit more aware of the effect of carbohydrates in your system and the need to balance it with protein, especially if you're diabetic, especially, um, this system runs way more efficiency and you'll get more miles out of your pancreas. Now there's two different types of diabetes. There is the one that we're talking about now, which we call adult onset or type two diabetes. It means we've worn out our pancreas, it just gave up. And then there's juvenile diabetes or what we call type one diabetes. This means that somebody is born with a pancreas that isn't working. They didn't misuse it over their lifetime. This is just, it doesn't work. So type one diabetes is usually treated with insulin. We're gonna inject the insulin. Um, type two diabetes, a lot of times we'll try to try uh, diet modifications and exercise first. Um, maybe some oral medications. We don't just jump right into insulin. It's kind of down the road a little bit. Good, does that make sense? All right, so let's go back to this for a second so I can explain to you why this is a bad idea. So this was our artery when we're born, very nice artery, we like it. It expands and contracts, not built up with a bunch of junk. But over time, we start getting a little bit of a buildup. Now, if you look at the difference between these two, you'll notice that the walls are thicker on this one, which decreases the diameter. If you look at them side by side, it decreases the diameter that blood has to travel through. Let's go back to our garden hose we talked about on Monday, right? We have a garden hose on a faucet outside and I turn the water on the pressure inside increases, right? What would happen if I used a smaller hose? Same amount of water, more pressure. You guys ever hear of blood pressure? When you decrease the size of your artery, the pressure inside automatically goes up. So this person has a little bit of high blood pressure going on, not a lot, but a little bit of high blood pressure going on. This should be a warning sign. Hey, there's some inside changes you probably should be paying attention to. But in America, we don't think the consequences count, so we don't pay attention to it. And we keep going on business as usual. And we end up with something more like this. So remember those crystals I talked about? We're gonna catch all of the goop and ick and shred the cells and all of that. Well, this is what we end up with. There's not a whole lot of room in there for good quality blood. So if I get injured, it may take me some time to heal. And as we go through life, if we don't take this seriously and get all of this under control, we end up with this. And this is bad, very bad because when sl blood slows down or stops, it clots. This is clotting blood. Now, if it clots in the legs, we end up with decreased circulation. If it clots in the brain, we call it a stroke. When it clots in the heart, we call it a heart attack. This has very serious consequences all over the body. So it'd be much, much better if we could figure this part out and avoid this, okay? You guys understand diabetes, fifth grade version? If you have a patient that uh, pressed the call I and to say, um, I would like a donut, and the patient has a history of, or an type two diabetes, uh, what do you do at that point? You say, hey, Okay, uh, you can go to the kitchen, see what they have, even though you know that is. We have, yeah, we have to balance the needs of the patient 
and their health concerns. So your care plan is not going to tell you to go get them a donut. The care plan is probably going to have them on a very strict calorie controlled, carbohydrate controlled diet. So chances are they're not, so this is where it gets tricky. Chances are they're not going to call you and say, hey, I want a donut. They're going to call their friends. <laughs> they're going to call their family members. They're going to call their enablers. And that's where the donuts are going to come from. Because when they call you and say, hey, I want a snack, you're going to offer them peanut butter and graham crackers because that's what we offer in our facility. And you're going to offer that to them. And they'll probably say, yeah, I'll take that. But in the meantime, they're on the phone with their significant others saying, hey, bring me some Krispy Kremes. So you're probably not going to know that they're eating donuts, chances are. You might walk in and catch them eating donuts, but they're probably not going to tell you, hey, by the way, I just finished off a half dozen. You'd be saying, hey, you didn't save me one? I mean, <laughs> come on. They're probably not going to be very forthcoming because I know there's a lecture in that. It's not our job to restrict. Yeah. It is our job to notify the nurse. So if the patient calls you up and says, hey, I want a donut, you can offer them those graham crackers and peanut butter and then let the nurse know, hey, they're looking for donuts. If a family member comes in with an oversized duffel bag <laughs> and you think that they're sneaking donuts, you want to let the nurse know of your suspicions. If you walk in and see them eating donuts, definitely let the nurse know. Because if they're on insulin, we're going to have to... Um, we're going to have to adjust our insulin levels based on that. Yeah, because I mean, the worst thing you want is just like to say, the family comes in with some donuts. They might, may or may not know the, the situation. And then you feed the resident a donut and then they go into diabetic coma. Or right. Like that. I'd be mad. Right. That, but I got to go tell them. Yeah. And you would be surprised at how many people will enable. Because it's a path of least resistance. Right, right. See, I and I say this a lot in my own family. I show my love through food. My dad was Italian. I, I, my dad adopted me, but my dad was Italian. So my whole life I grew up, I mean, food is life. Food is love. And if I love you, I'm going to shower you with food because that's how, that's just how I show my, that's my love language, right? I cook. And I will try to make you happy. If I know you like cheesecake, I'm going to make you a cheesecake, right? And even if I know you shouldn't have that cheesecake, if it's going to make you happy, I may try to find another alternative and float that by you. But chances are you're going to want the cheesecake and I'm going to make it for you because that's who I am. A lot of family members will do that. Even if they know that it's not best for the patient because that's their love language. That's, that's fine. That's, that's the family member's role is to make the patient happy. That is their role. As a nurse, my role is to educate all of them about this. And when I explain it this way, people tend to get it a little bit more. Okay, I understand that he likes cheesecake and I understand that that's how you show love and I get it, I do. But instead of cheesecake, how about if we maybe offer a higher protein alternative? That way he, his body isn't breaking down the protein of his muscles and he can maintain strength and mobility a little longer. When you get the, the families a little more involved and a little more educated, they tend to have better compliance. But that's not the CNA role. The CNA role is not to educate. That's the nurse's role. And I really wish I could tell you there's, you know, all the nurses you're going to have are good. They're not. Some nurses will actively punish an adult patient for their food choices. And I put it like this. If I were to go across the street to one of the drive throughs right down the road, and I was to stand in front of the drive through and every car that came through, I, if I said, you cannot have fries. They're bad for you. They're high in saturated fat. They're high in carbs. No fries. No Coke. That has tons of sugar. What are you, insane? Water. You can have chicken nuggets, no sauce, water. That's it. That's all you get to order off this menu. How far am I going to get before somebody 
attacks me. <laughs> yeah, because you're an adult. And if you want the prize, there is not a single person on this planet that is, has the right or the ability to restrict that choice from you. You are an adult. It does not matter if you're in a car at a drive through or a bed in a facility, you are an adult with that right. So we have to be careful not to step over. Yeah, the fries aren't good for you. Your pancreas isn't working. Do you know what you're doing to your arteries? I get it. We wanna, we wanna love our patients to death. But sometimes it's not that, that interferes with their rights. So education is a much better alternative. And I have absolutely worked with a ton of diabetic patients and just got them to understand when you're craving those donuts or those M&Ms, it's because your cells are starving. That, that's the, the, your brain is saying, hey, I need sugar, right? Cells are starving. They need sugar to live. I need sugar. I, I want M&Ms or I want donuts or I want cake. You know, that's what they crave. If I get them to understand that, your craving is a result of your cells starving, but that sugar is not going to go into your cells. It's not. So have protein. Have a little bit of carbs that satisfies your brain, but have protein with it. And once diabetics start to do that, their cravings go down. They start to realize that they overall feel better. And that, that effect in the body has that reinforcing um, aspect of it. So they're less likely to eat those M&Ms. You know, when they start to realize the, what their body's trying to tell them and how to work with that. Um, a little education goes a long way with patients, a long way. But all it is, is your cells are starving. Your brain's trying to fix it. Brain doesn't know. Brain has no idea there's sugar in the bloodstream that's not being used. Cells are starving. It calls for a Snickers, right? Not you when you're hungry. <laughs> all right, make sense? Good. Okay. So to go over this again, what we're doing with this skill, remember we have our opening, we have, we're going to use a barrier on the floor. We do want gloves for this skill, by the way, because the whole reason we're there is to look at the bottom of the foot, which is historically hidden in socks and shoes. You don't know if there's something there. There's an unknown. So remember I said with these rules, it's if it's yes, or maybe we need gloves. This is a maybe, right? We don't know if there's a wound on the bottom of the foot. That's why we're looking. So we want some gloves with this one. Um, I was told one time that somebody, they weren't paying attention to somebody's feet. The and diabetes didn't have any sense of feeling. It was thumbtacks. Like okay, that. That, that's, yeah. So that actually, that's the story I tell in class. Okay. Yep. So years and years and years ago, I was an agency nurse. These are substitute nurses. So you remember in high school when your main teacher couldn't show up, they brought in a sub, just somebody to fill the, you know, teacher gap there, right? Yeah, warm body. Um, well, that's what agency nurses are. They're a substitute nurse in a facility. And I went in, got report on my patients. I go into my patient's room. We're going to call him Henry. And when I walked into Henry's room, his room was dark except for one light above his bed, just that little tiny fluorescent light right above the bed. And as I walk in, I flip the light on because I got to do a head to toe assessment. I need to know what I'm working with here. And as soon as I flip that light on, he starts yelling, turn it off, turn it off. Okay. So I flip the light back off, walk to the bed. And now I'm asking, can I ask why you don't want the light on? You have a headache. What's up? He's like, no, I've got diabetic retinopathy. The bright light really hurts my eyes. Okay, cool. No problem. So remember that because that's going to be important in the story right? The lights are off, small light above the bed. So on, um, so I, I, as I'm standing there talking to him, I got a cup of pills. I'm, I'm, you know, just kind of getting to know him a little bit. And as I'm standing there, I can odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, they're very distinctive. Yeah. A wound is a wound and it smells like a wound and I'm smelling a wound. So as I'm talking to him, I'm pulling my report sheet out of my pocket and I'm kind of looking over it. There's nothing on the report sheet about a wound. <laughs> well, maybe I missed something, you know, a treatment that needs to be done. Nothing there. Uh-oh. 
Now I got to find this wound. I know there is one. I can smell it. I got to find it. So I ask him, hey, Henry, can you flip over and let me take a peek? Because I think you might have a wound brewing somewhere. He's like, do what you got to do. It's a very gruff man. Now, I didn't tell you, this guy was only in his 50s. He was very young. And he had uh, several health concerns. And he was on the rehab unit, you know, getting rehab before he went home. So he flips over. And he did not want to be there, by the way. He flips over and I look at all the usual suspects. I looked at the tops of his ears, the back of his head, his shoulder blades, his lower back or coccyx area, the backs of his legs. And I get down to his feet and I'm not seeing anything that's really standing out at me, but I get down to his feet and he's got those slipper socks on. You know, the socks with little dots on the bottom of them. And um, I said, Henry, I need to take your socks off and look at your feet. He, he yells immediately, no. Okay, well, there's my clue. Because if he's telling me no, what did he tell the CNAs? And nobody's been reporting it. So we have no idea how long it's been since somebody's looked at the bottom of his feet. No clue. Because if he's telling the nurse no, I know he wasn't cooperative with the CNAs. So I sweet talked him because you can always get further with patients by being nice than being nasty, always. So when I've got a non-compliant patient, I turn up the charm. I am really hard to resist when I get super sweet. I am really hard to resist. So I charmed him and I got him to agree. And I took the left sock off, no problem. Skin was flaky, definitely could be cleaned, but not in bad shape. I got to take the right sock off and it stuck to the bottom of his foot, stuck there. Well, there's my problem. So I go get a basin of salt water, normal saline, and I put the whole foot in there, warmed up the water, put the whole foot, sock and all, let it loosen up so I can get that sock off and see what I'm working with there. And I come back like 10 minutes later, get my gloves on, go to take the sock off. And as I was taking the sock off, it was resisting. It was stuck to the bottom of his foot, even after soaking. So I kind of gave it a little, you know, a little tug just to get it to loosen up so I could see what I'm working with. And something fell off of his foot. So now I'm going looking and it, it rolled onto the floor and it was up near a baseboard. It's baseboards like this, you know, that, that are like the wide plastic. And the floor was like this all speckled. So it took me a minute to find it. But when I found it, this is what I found. Obviously, this is not the. But it was one of these flat metal white thumbtacks. Right? The ones that have the metal post. This was stuck in the bottom of his foot. So, no, well, found my problem. <laughs> so now I call the doctor. I call the family. I called the wound care specialist. I took pictures. I documented everything. I did a treatment on it, you know, with the medication and the bandage and all of that. And then I go, not my patient, not my facility. Nine or 10 months later, uh, not quite a year, but a long time after I get assigned back to that facility, but this time I'm on the long-term care side. And um, as I'm getting report, I notice that Henry's name is on my report sheet. Now this is not good because he was only in his 50s and he was supposed to go to rehab and go home. Now he's in long-term care. So I know this guy took a wrong turn somewhere. So I walked in and I said, hey, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot. How's it going? And he whips the sheets back and he says, you tell me. And he had had to have a below the knee amputation. He lost his leg over that because he was diabetic. Now, my first clue was that he had retinopathy, right? Diabetic retinopathy. That told you he was diabetic. And because he was diabetic, his um, arterial and nervous system was affected by all that excess blood sugar. So he didn't know that he had an injury to his foot. That information could not make its way to his brain. And because the sugar was coating the inside of the arteries, 
he wasn't able to get good blood flow to that area to heal it once it was found. And because the wound festered and festered and festered, he ended up having a below the knee amputation. And then he couldn't take care of himself at home because he was all alone and ended up in long-term care. And this is where he's going to live the rest of their life. And that to me is really tragic because the whole thing was 100% preventable. 100%. If he had had shoes on when he was walking, where would the thumbtack be? In the shoe. Absolutely. We don't amputate shoes. When you have a diabetic patient, you should never, ever, ever walk them without something on their feet beyond slipper socks. Slipper socks are not enough. Slipper socks are not going to protect them against injury. Shoes will. And if they don't have good blood flow, good circulation, good nervous system um, because of diabetes, they can have an injury there that they're not even aware of. And that's what happened to this guy. And it was tragic. It was horrible to be in your 50s, to have something like this happen and affect your ability to live independently from that point forward. That's horrible. So we've got to take this pretty seriously. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh, it's horrible, horrible. I still think about him. All right, let's go back here. I'm gonna show you this skill. I am not getting down on the floor because I'll never get back up. <laughs> My days of that are over. I've got to retape all, I, I have to retape all of these videos this year, right? Because they're the videos that I'm showing you are from 2016, they're all still relevant. They're all still accurate. But in YouTube world, anything longer than, you know, older than a minute is considered ancients. So I've got to redo these videos. And this is the one that's really making me stressed out because I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get back down, or back up off the floor. Yeah, out of all the skills, this is the one that's got me stressed. Oh, where are you from here? Hey for guns, my name is Johnny. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. I need to take what care. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Let me go close the curtain, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get a barrier and we'll place this on the floor right in front of you and you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap and lotion. Place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water to wash. Okay, Mr. Gunn, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Yes. Very good. good. Yes, that's great. Very good. I'm going to set this here. And I'm going to needle on the barrier and apply my gloves. Roll up your pants leg and lift your foot so I can remove your sock. We'll place your foot in the basin to soak. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out. Making sure that your foot is wet. 
I'm going to place your foot over here on the towel and apply soap to the washcloth. I'm going to wash all surfaces of the foot. I'm going to lift your foot up so I can wash the bottom. And I'll observe for any gray areas, slows, sores, or any other abnormalities. We'll put your foot back in the basin. Push the brakes. Okay, I'm going to place your foot on the towel to dry. I'll ensure all surfaces have been dried thoroughly. I'll take one of the narrow edges and go between your toes to block. And I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply some lotion. Warm the lotion in our hands. Apply lotion to all surfaces except between the toes. So I'm going to lift your foot. We'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Oh, go ahead and place your foot back on the variable. And now I can reapply your side. We'll put your shoe back on. Can you try to get in there? Go ahead, please. Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies in. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning procedure. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the face and back in the middle. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, yes. Okay, your call light is here. If you just need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get you a magazine while you're waiting? No, please. I'm going to open my curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps in my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator if my skill is done. Okay, questions on quick care? Whoops. It's just like that it out there. But we don't have to do anything with toenails other than um, take a look at them, report anything that we notice. All right, so let's go to page 106. You're not going to have any practice time today, but starting on Monday, you will have practice time built into the class. So on Monday, I have um, four skills that I'm going to teach you, and you should have about a half hour at the end of the class on Monday to be able to start practicing. On Wednesday, you'll have about 45 minutes to an hour. The following Monday, you'll have about an hour to an hour and a half. So as we go through the program, the first two weeks, I don't give you a whole lot of practice time in class because we're still in the learning phase. 
but starting next week, we're going to get into um, the part where you can actually start practicing in the, the classroom. Please remember that you do have this classroom available to you on class days up until four o'clock. So you can practice um, until four. All right, so uh, page 106 is assist the resident with a bedpan. So the care plan at the top of the page says the resident has requested a bedpan. The resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self. The resident is able to move as directed. Let me explain to you why this care plan says what it does. If you look at the bottom of the page, you're gonna see that this is done on a live testing student. That means that one of you may be the patient for bedpan. Don't panic. You are not really going to use the bedpan. You're gonna remain fully clothed and they're gonna put a patient gown on over your clothing. So um, you're not going to get unclothed. You're not really going to use a bedpan. It's gonna be a simulation but somebody's really gonna put a bedpan under you. Now, the reason the care plan says they're not wearing undergarments and they're able to wipe self is because they don't want somebody trying to pull your pants off during the test or get into your areas to clean. So that this allows the evaluators to say the care plan says they do not need that service. Okay, does that make sense? All right, it says the resident's able to move as directed. Yay, yippee, that is awesome because we can ask the patient to lift their hips and they will. <laughs> so that is, that makes the skill so much easier. But if you have a patient that can't lift their hips, rolling them to the side, putting the bedpan on their bottom and rolling them back on top of the bedpan is how you would put it in place. The trick is once they've used it, you've got to hold it flat for them to move, to roll off of it so you can take it away. That part can get a little bit tricky because as they're rolling, that bedpan's gonna wanna flip up. So it, yeah, it can get a little bit tricky. Now, in order to understand this, I have to tell you about toileting methods. So go back a page to 105. Remember as a nurse, I have to look at all real problems and potential problems, right? And in reality, this isn't even a problem that I have to solve because the doctor will write bathroom orders for patients. So the, this actually comes from the doctor. That's how important this is. But I'm gonna have some impact on this because I'm going to be relaying to the doctor any changes that I see in the patients. But there's a specific hierarchy here that has to be followed. Ideally, I want my patients to get up out of bed and go to the bathroom all by themselves. I do not want to be involved. That is ideal. That is what we want. That is the, the, what we call the gold standard. If they can't get to the bathroom by themselves, then maybe they need some assistance. And that would be bathroom with assist. If they can get up and go to the bathroom all by themselves, we call it BRP, bathroom privileges. Now this um, is going to be on page, keep your finger here, but go to page 61 real quick. These are some medical abbreviations. You're probably going to want to take a, a look at this, um, 61, 62, and 63. This is a nice little um, activity for you to be able to define some medical abbreviations. But if you look in that first column about two thirds of the way down, you'll see BRP, bathroom privileges. That's what I'm talking about. So if the patient can go all on their own, we're not involved, they have BRP, bathroom privileges. If they need some help, you'll see bathroom with assist. That's ideal. We want one of those two. But sometimes patients can't get all the way to the bathroom for whatever reasons. In that case, I would consider a bedside commode or BSC, bedside commode. Now that's a portable toilet. You can see it in the back corner back there beside the sink. It is a portable toilet that we bring right to the bedside. The patient transfers from bed to the, the bedside commode. It has to be cleaned, emptied and cleaned after use, but it still gives that toileting experience. 
right? Upright, sitting, still toileting experience. So you can have bedside commode ad lib, which means how, whenever they want to use it, or bedside commode with assist. If they can't get to the bathroom with or without assist or use a bedside commode with or without assist, now I'm in trouble. Now I'm left with a very few options. So the first thing I got to find out is, are they even continent? Do they, are they holding it? I, you know, are they able to control their bowel and blood? If they're not, if they're incontinent, that's a whole different ballgame. We'll talk about that next week. But if they are continent and they can't get to the bathroom and they can't use a bedside commode, I've only got two options, either a catheter, which we don't use for convenience. We have to have a medical reason to have a catheter or a bedpan. Do you see how much stuff I have to get through to get to bedpan? It is not first choice. It is never first choice, ever. And that's because the bedpan comes with a ton of problems. The first problem is psychological. You have been taught from the time you are this tall, don't pee in the bed. And certainly don't poop in the bed. So just because we put a plastic pan under your butt does not mean your brain is going to let you go because lessons learned early in life are hard to overcome. So there's a psychological restriction here. Most patients that have bedpans, it'll take them two or three tries to even be able to go. So don't get mad at them. That is normal. That is expected. But if we got another option, we're going to take it. <laughs> now, the other problem with bedpan is that it's not physically comfortable. There, um, there, there's a whole host of problems here. First of all, when you put a bedpan underneath a patient, we're going to talk about females for a minute. That bedpan that you have underneath their undercarriage is only about this deep. So when urine comes out under pressure and hits a flat plastic surface, you're going to get splashback. The whole undercarriage is going to be wet. This is not comfortable. It's not easy to clean. It's not optimal. It's a problem. Bowel movements are even more problematic because bedpans narrow as they go up. So the area to catch the bowel movement is this far from the undercarriage. So you're going to you're gonna have a mess on your hands no matter how you slice this. Does that make sense? Bed pans are not optimal. We try everything else before we get to bed pan. But if the care plan says bed pan, we've already gone through those options. This is what we set it on. We gotta work with what we've got. Okay, good. All right, the main problem, oh, real quick. If you look at the bottom of page 105, you can see that little uh, toilet picture. You guys see the toilet picture? All right, you see the thing that looks like a shower head? That is called a bedpan cleaner. You're gonna find those in acute care settings like hospitals, some rehabs, a few nursing homes, not many. What that does is when you um, bend it forward over the toilet, it'll start spraying. It's a bedpan cleaner. It allows you to clean the bedpan right over the toilet. It's ideal, awesome. The problem with it is you've got water under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface. You're going to get splashback. You have to dress for the job. You don't want any of that stuff on your uniform or in any of the holes on your face. So you want to wear one of those yellow isolation gowns over your clothing. And you want to make sure you have a mask and a face shield. By the way, masks do not help with odor. That is a fallacy. Masks do not help with odor. They do not. If you have an odor issue, uh, a better option is to get some Vicks. You know, the stuff mom used to rub on your chest, right? When you were a kid. Yep, put it right underneath your nose. Now for me, I have very, very sensitive skin. I will look like Rudolph in about 20 seconds if I put Vicks under my nose. Um, I react to the menthol. So what I use is I just go get like to the Dollar Tree and get the little things of Vaseline and mix in a, a few drops of essential oil. I like lemongrass or orange blossom. And I use that instead. It's not a perfect solution, but it does help. 
especially if you're prone to gagging. It will help. Yeah. But let me explain to you the most important part of bedpan. This is the part that people don't really think of too much. So let's say we have a patient. Can everybody see this? Let's say we have a patient laying in bed. If I put a bedpan underneath the patient's bottom, what does it do to their middle? Yeah, it raises it up. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? How many of you can poop uphill? So when you put a bedpan underneath the patient, the single most important step is to get the head of the bed up to get them in a sitting position. Otherwise they won't be able to go. Or if they do go, it's gonna run right up their back and into their hair. And that's really high on my gross meter, okay? So now that we have the patient sitting on the bedpan, they're pressing it down into the bed. You can't pull it out from under them if they're sitting on it. So to get it out, you've got to put the head of the bed back down to take that bedpan out. Now, with all of this moving of the head of the bed, whatever's in there is going to be sloshing around. So we need something on the bed that might be absorbent and waterproof. What do we have that's like, like that? Yeah, the chucks or barrier. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to put that on the bed, bedpan on the chucks, head of the bed up. Give them call light toilet paper. Tell them to call you when they're done step away from the building <laughs> because people can't go if you're in there. Yeah, they have to have privacy for sure. Now, the problem is for the test, you have no other patients. <laughs> this is it. You, you're stuck with one and you can't leave the testing center. So for the test, you're just going to step on the other side of the curtain. You do not need to wash your hands. You do not need to do your closing. You're still there, but you're on the other side of the curtain. In a clinical setting, don't do that. In a clinical setting, go wash your hands, go take care of somebody else. In fact, if the roommate can take a walk, now is a good time to take the roommate for a walk. That gives the patient some privacy, right? Because there's sounds and there's odors and people get very, very fixated on that and they get all stressed out and bound up and then they can't go. So if you can clear the room for them, it makes it a little bit easier. But for the test, we don't have that option. We're just going to step on the other side of the curtain and wait for them to say, I'm done. Good. When you come back in, put the head of the bed back down. And we're going to take that whole thing, the bedpan and the chucks together out from under the patient because you cannot carry an open container of urine through a room. Duh, <laughs> right? If you trip on your shoelaces, you're going face first into whatever's in that bedpan. Yeah, not good. So you want that bedpan covered and you're gonna take it over to the bathroom. Now, remember for the test, there's nothing in the bedpan we're simulating, but we're gonna dump the pretend pee into the toilet because that's where it goes. We'll rinse the pan, dump that rinse water into the toilet because that's where it goes. And then we're gonna dry and soar the bedpan. Now, our care plan told us the patient is able to wipe themselves. So we know where their hands have been. What do you think they need after? Clean hands. Yeah, clean hands. So however you want to do that, give them a hand wipe, give them a wet soapy washcloth. I don't care how you accomplish it, but get those hands clean before lunch, please. Okay, so that is a testing checkpoint, is giving them some way to wash their hands. Good. Do you think we need a privacy blanket for this? Yeah, and you could use the sheet. I mean, it's possible to keep the patient covered with a sheet, but with all that sloshing around and stuff under pressure and stuff's gonna go everywhere, the privacy blanket is a better option. Okay, good. Any questions on that one? Most important step, by far the most important step is the head of the bed. Because if you don't do that, the rest of it doesn't matter. Now I will give you two things you can do in a clinical setting with the nurse's permission that make this so much easier. Oh my gosh, this, this makes bedpan way easier, but you have to ask the nurse. If you take toilet paper and do big loops of toilet paper, big loops, four or five big loops, and you lay that on the inside of the bedpan, It'll absorb the urine. It helps cut down on sound. 
on odor and on sloshing. We like to do that. The problem is if we're measuring the urine, we can't, you can't use toilet paper. The second thing you can do is ask the nurse, but if you sprinkle some powder on the seat of the, of the bedpan, the part that's going under the bottom, it helps you remove it a whole lot easier. Without that, if it's just a bare bottom on the bed, plastic bedpan, have you ever worn shorts in a car with leather seats? You stick. So when you try to take that bedpan out from under it, under the patient, it's going to stick to their bottom and you're going to have to kind of pull on it. And again, you got liquid in there. So that's a problem. So if you can put powder on the seat of the bedpan and toilet paper in it, it makes this go so much smoother. You can't use that on the test, either one. And you won't be able to use it with all of your patients. You have to ask the nurse. If the patient has a respiratory condition, we can't use powders around them. It makes them cough, can aggravate a respiratory condition. If they have an open wound, we don't want powders because that can get in the wound and delay healing. The silica can delay healing. So we wanna ask the nurse if those two things are allowed. Okay, good. Questions? All right, let me show you this video. Ooh. And I can finish printing out my stuff here. Hello. Hi, Mr. Dennis. My name is Gabby. I'm the CNA. Today, how are you? Good, how are you? Wonderful. I understand you need a bed Can I assist you with that? Sure. I'm going to close that part and wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'll need a truck. Okay, thank Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this privacy blanket over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy as we do this skill. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to spread this out without snapping it or shaking it. And I'll have you hold this in place so I can pull your sheet down. That way your sheet remains clean as we do this skill. Okay, I'm going to prepare a chest to place under you before we put the bed pan in place. I'm going to hold the chest up lengthwise and roll it toward me. Clean roll toward me, dirty roll to it. And I'll just place this on the bed. I'm going to open the drawer that the bed pan is in and get a set of gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bend your knees with your hips as high off the bed as you can, and I'm going to unroll the chucks underneath you. Okay? okay. All right, go ahead and bend your knees and lift up. Okay, and you can relax. I'm going to go around to the other side of the bed and unroll. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you lift up again, please? Pull the chucks out, making sure it's positioned properly on the bed. You can relax. Okay, now I'll get the bed pan out and get the door. I'm going to place this under your bottom if I can get you to lift and relax. Is that comfortable? Yes. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up, but let me remove my gloves first. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up. Please tell me when you're comfortable. Okay. 
and you may have to adjust that bed stand a little bit as it moves. Tell me when you're comfortable. That's good. Okay. Here's your toilet paper and your call light. And I'm just going to wait out here. Please let me know when you're done. Okay, Mr. Jones, I understand your minutes. Let me help you with that. I'm going to put the head of the bed down now. And please do not lift your hips. Once the head of the bed is in the lower position, I'll put on a pair of gloves. And I'm going to hold that bed stand flat as you lift off. Okay, Mr. Jones, you're going to take four of the strokes and hold the bed stand flat as you lift off of it. You can go ahead and lift on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I'll remove both the bed stand and the chest and take you to the bathroom for disposal. I'll be right back. Once I get over here to the bathroom, I'm going to unwrap the bed stand and we'll throw the chucks away. I'm going to empty the contents of the bed stand into the toilet. And then I'll rinse the bed stand. Deposit the rinse water into the toilet as well. And then we'll set the bed pan down to dry. I'll pick it up with a paper towel. I'm going to dry the inside. We'll throw that paper towel away. I'll dry the outside. Throw that paper towel away. And get one for the door. Okay, I'm going to place the bed pan in the drawer, along with the toilet paper. And we'll use the paper towel to close the drawer. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, would you like to wipe your hands? Thank you. Okay, you can relax your legs if you'd like. And I'm going to pull your sheet up and remove the privacy blanket. I want to make sure that we roll the blanket in a ball so that any trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to go put this in 30 minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine for you? Your call light is there. Please let me know if there's anything that we can do. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right. Almost done today. Just bear with me a little bit more. Any questions on bed pan? I have a question. Yes. Is the roof up to explain? Great question. Out loud, what they're doing. So remember that these videos are made to teach you how to do stuff, right? So I'm saying all of these steps so you can learn how to do the skills. But do you know who else doesn't know how to how the skills should be done? The patient. So just like I'm explaining to you how to do the skill, you should be explaining to the patient how what you're doing with their body. So the answer to that is yes, you should be saying out loud what you're doing. Okay. Now you're not graded on the words you use or how in depth. It doesn't have to sound exactly like what I'm doing, but you should be explaining to the patient. I'm just saying because I don't want to mess up. <laughs> yeah. But imagine for a second, just think about this for a second. I always think about the patient experience, right? This patient is in a strange place surrounded by strangers. They're scared to death. They don't know what's happening with their own body at this point. They probably don't have any family in the room with them. It's just them and a stranger. Can you imagine somebody coming, put yourself in that position, right? You're the patient. 
Can you imagine some random person coming in off the street, grabbing your body and starting to move it? And you don't know why or what they're doing, or is it going to hurt? Or what am I expected to do? Can you imagine the, the, the fear that would go into that? That's really why you should be explaining to the patient because they don't know what you're doing. But also think about how awkward that would be. It would be very awkward to have somebody working on you not talking. Yeah, I understand that, but when I bathe you, um, getting ready to wash your hands or, or say, okay, I'm going, I'm not going to shake you, I'm not going to this and that, you have to you don't have to say all of that to the patient. Like, you know, I'm not going to shake the blanket or, you know, I'm going to unfold the blanket, being careful not to snap it. You don't have to say that. But again, remember those evaluators, they're looking at a checklist. So the more you say out loud, if they're not physically looking at, if they're looking down at the checklist and they hear you say something, you'll get a check mark for it. You don't have to, it's not a graded checkpoint where you have to, but there's a lot of benefits to doing it. Yeah, there's a lot of benefits. A lot of students, all right, have you ever watched a movie so often that you learned the lines? Yeah. Right? And you can like recite the lines. Yeah. If you watch my videos enough and you just recite the lines, <laughs> um, evaluators know who came from from me right? because you all sound the same <laughs> you know they, they can pick you guys out of the crowd yeah but it, it is helpful but I always think about it from the patient if I were the person laying there and I was alone and afraid what would I want to know yeah I would want to know as much information as you can give me don't be afraid to overshare I, I want to know what why are you going in my drawer? My wallet's in there. You may be just getting a toothbrush, but my wallet's in there. You know, if you come in and tell me you're going to do a skill and then you leave, I don't know, am I supposed to follow you? What, what am I supposed to do here? You just said you're going to do something and then you walk away. I, what, what, what do I do? And that, that just causes all kinds of turmoil because I'm a people pleaser. Right, I, I'm, I'm probably going to get out of bed and follow you, and all you're doing is washing your hands. <laughs> so if you tell me, okay, I'm going to go close your curtain and wash my hands. I'll be right back. Oh, cool! I don't have to do anything. My expectation is now set. You're washing your hands. I can relax. Right, but if I don't know what you're doing, if I don't know that you're going over to wash your hands, I may be tempted to come because I don't know what you want from me. Does that make sense? The more information you give to your patients, the better off your patients will be. And the more cooperative they'll become. People get resistant if they're afraid, if they're unsure, or if they've been hurt in the past. Those are the three main reasons people are resistant. Well, I can take care of afraid and unsure just by talking to them. I can't really take care of being hurt in the past other than to do my best not to repeat that and build trust. Okay. Yeah, do I also have to like tell them how I'm washing my hands? Mm -mm. Okay. No. No, you don't have to do that. I do that more for you guys. You don't have to do that. Okay. But if you do, it kind of triggers stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, it will. When you talk out your skills, you tend to do better because it's triggering your memory. But you don't have to. All right, let's go to page 53. All right, so page 53, this is a, a super easy skill. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in four minutes or less. Range of motions are super easy, super easy. 
Our care plan here tells us to provide the following. Now, don't freak out about the words. I'm going to explain all the words in a minute, but let's just read the care plan first. It says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's left shoulder, flexion extension and abduction adduction. Provide three repetitions of each exercise. The resident is not able to help with the exercises. So let me explain to you what range of motion is. So first of all, we have to understand that there's two types of range of motion. There's active and passive. And this one actually tells us passive. So if you go back to page 51, everything I'm about to tell you, is on page 51 and 52. So active range of motion is when the patient does the work, I'm just telling them what to do and making sure they do it properly. So if I can get everybody to stand up for a second, I would like you to extend your left arm above your head like you're asking a question. Left arm all the way up. Don't let that elbow, get your elbow straight. There we go, straight up, straight up. Bring it all the way down. Let's do it again. Bring it up in front of you, not to the side. Bring it up to the front of you all the way up as straight as we can get it and all the way back down. One more time, please. All the way up and all the way back down. That was active range of motion. I told you what to do. I made sure you were doing it properly, but you're the one that did the work. Go ahead and have a seat. That is not what we're doing here. <laughs> this is passive range of motion. What do you think passive means? Yeah, patient's not doing it, I am. <laughs> That's right. So passive range of motion means that the patient is just passively involved. Okay, they're just laying there. We're going to do the work. Now, there's three main exercises that CNAs do. Well, let's get into what, hold on. Let me get to what range of motion is first. CNAs do exercises to retain function. This gets mixed up in CNA's heads a lot. We tend to think that if we're doing exercises on a patient, it must be to make them get better, to improve something, but that is not the case. We have a whole department for that. Anybody know what a department is that does exercises to make people better? Physical therapy. Now, a physical therapist has to have a doctorate degree. That's 10 to 12 years of education. How long are we here? Four weeks, can't be us, not us. Physical therapy assistant is a two-year degree. How long are we here? Can't be us. We do not do exercises to make people better. That takes way more training and experience than we have. Not us. CNAs work on healthy body extremities to keep them in the same condition. We retain function. Physical therapy regains function. Do you understand the difference there? So if a patient had surgery on their right shoulder, we're not doing exercises on the right shoulder. We would be doing exercises on the left shoulder to maintain that function while they're getting physical therapy on the right. Good? Make sense? I need to set your expectations here. So. There's three main exercises that CNAs do. It Flexion extension, which is an up-down motion. You guys just did this one. I asked you to extend your arm above your head like you're asking a question. That's extension. Bringing it back down was flexion. There are two halves of the same exercise. We also have abduction, adduction. Now, when you abduct the child, don't do that. It's bad, by the way. But when you abduct the child, you take it away from its family. What do you think adduct, A-D-D, brings it back, right? So two halves of the same exercise. Abduct takes it away, adduct takes it back. This is more of a side-to-side -side motion. So if we're abducting the arm, we wanna bring it out to the side. If we're adducting it, we're bringing it back. So this is kind of like a snow angel, right? Okay. And then there's rotation. Rotation is just one because you always end where you start. It's an around motion. So you aren't going to do all exercises on all body parts. How do we know what exercises to do? How, how do we know what body part? How do we know how many repetitions? It's a recipe. Just follow it. That's it. Recipe. Follow it. 
Um, somebody in one of the CNA groups this morning was asking for tips on testing. They're getting ready to retest. They tested previously, got range of motion and did it on the wrong body part, on the wrong side and failed and didn't understand why they failed. That's it. Did that simple answer. Didn't follow the care plan. Right? It's not about how well you do the exercises. It's about did you read and follow directions? People are amazed when they realize the test really is that easy. Just read the direction and follow it. Everybody's expecting a curveball. There's no curveball. Read it and follow it. That's it. Okay? Okay, when we're doing range of motion, there's some rules we're gonna follow. We're always gonna lift from below with a flat palm. Remember, we're not the claw machine at Walmart, right? We don't grab something and lift. We always wanna return to start. So if you're doing flexion extension on the left shoulder, right? And we go up, we have to return back to start. If I come to here, that is not a range of motion. This does not work. We have to go all the way back to start. And then we'll do it again, all the way up and all the way back to start. Don't take shortcuts here. We always want to support it to joints. So when we're lifting from below, whether it's the arm or the leg, we're supporting at the joints. And we want to monitor for pain. Sometimes patients will let you know when they're having pain. They say things like, ow, or that hurts. That's a pretty clear indication of pain. Some people are not vocal. They'll stiffen up, they'll resist, they'll wince or grimace, they'll turn their head to the side. They give you nonverbal clues that there's pain. Pay attention to those as well. So we're going to ask, are you having any pain or does that hurt? But we also want to watch them for signs of pain as well. If we get pain, remember, we are not physical therapy, right? Physical therapy says things like, no pain, no gain. That's why we call them the torture chamber. That's not us. If we raise the arm up to here and get pain, they wince, they grimace, they turn away, they stiffen up, they say, ow, whatever it is, then we're going to go all the way back to start because we always go to start. And then the next one will go below that level of pain. Remember, we're just trying to maintain what they've got. We're not trying to make it better. We're maintaining. And then we're going to let the nurse know, hey, I got to here and got, ow. It's their problem now, not mine. <laughs> right? Good? Questions? Oops, we'll come back here. All right. So this one, um, our care plan, let's go back to that again, says to provide passive range of motion to the left shoulder, flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. So we're going to go up, down three times. We're going to go side to side three times. We're working on the left shoulder. That's the patient's left, not yours. We're going to do an opening in front and a closing behind. And that's the whole skill. It can be done in four minutes or less. It actually takes about two. <laughs> super, super quick. Okay, good. Questions? I'm going to show you this one. Questions? Let me explain to you why CNAs might do this, though. This is just a really quick story. I'm going to talk about Frank. Frank is a widower. He lost his wife a couple of years ago. He's in his mid seventies. He's very, very active, lives alone in a home across the street in Timber Pines, plays bridge and shuffleboard and tennis and all kinds of stuff. Well, he's very competitive with his brother. And on this particular day, he and his brother, Ralph, went to the tennis court and he was determined to win. And he hit a volley as hard as he could. And when he did, he felt something in his shoulder give way. And he dropped his tennis court, grabbed his shoulder, and off to the ER they go. ER doc says, I've got good news and bad news. So bad news is you tore your right rotator cuff and you're probably right-handed. He's like, yep. He says, that's bad news. The good news is the surgeon has an opening tomorrow and can fit you in. He says, well, sign me up. I can't go home like this. So he has surgery. And two days later, the discharge planner at the hospital comes in and says, I need that bed. You got to go somewhere. You can't stay here, but you need physical therapy and you can't drive. So do you have somebody at home that can take you back and forth to physical therapy? 
um, somebody that can help you with cooking and bathing and dressing because, you know, you got that sling on. You're not moving a whole lot. You're going to need a little help. And he says, no, my wife passed away a couple of years ago and my brother works. I'm all alone. She says, OK, what about a rehab? You've got physical therapy right there. You can walk down the hallway, get your physical therapy twice a day. They got people that make meals for you and they got pretty girls to help you brush your teeth, zip your zippers and all the other stuff that needs to be done. And he says, sign me up. So here he is in our facility. Now, as the nurse, I have to go in and do a head to toe assessment. I'm looking for real problems and potential problems, right? And I write up our care plan and I'm gonna ask you to help him with bathing and dressing and grooming. And I'm gonna ask you to help him with cutting his meat and opening his milk. And I'm gonna ask you to help him get back and forth to physical therapy and make sure he maintains his schedule. And at the end of six weeks, physical therapy did an awesome job on that right arm. But he's had you helping with bathing, dressing and grooming and you helping with cutting stuff up and opening milk. How much work has that left arm done? None. So what do you think is going to happen over six weeks to an arm that's not moving? Yeah, it seizes up. It's actually called a frozen shoulder. You're going to lose muscle mass, atrophy, and you're going to lose mobility in the joints. So when he gets discharged six weeks from now, we fix his right shoulder. Yay us. We broke his left. Oops. Did we really help him? Yeah, we did not help him. He's actually in the same condition he came in in, just reverse. We did not do our job. So let's back up to the day he comes in. And as a nurse, I go in and do a head to toe assessment. Remember, I'm looking for real problems and potential ones. And I know this is a potential problem. So I would ask you to help him with bathing, dressing, and grooming. You're going to help him with cutting his meat and opening his milk. You're going to get him to physical therapy on time. But I'm going to ask you to do some range of motion exercises twice a shift on the left shoulder. That way we can maintain that function that's already there. Make sense? This is why doing range of motion on the correct extremity is so important. Because what if she gets mixed up? and goes in and starts moving the right arm that just had surgery. What could happen? Oh yeah, we can mess it all up, right? We could scramble his shoulder, all kinds of different ways. So this is why the side that you perform the skill on matters because it has an effect on the patient and that's what it's all about, right? All right, let me get somebody to come lay down in this bed a volunteer of some sort. <laughs> you are designated, you know, it's funny, every class has a designated volunteer and I'm not sure how that happens. Okay, um, I'm actually going to do the top down view for this. There we go. Should be able to see that a little better. All right, I'm going to simulate hand washing for the sake of time. Here we go. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Awesome. I need to do some exercises on that left arm. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands and I'll be right back. I have clean hands. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm gonna do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this, okay? Can I get you to scoot your body down just a little bit for me? There you go, okay. All right, so I'm gonna lift your arm above your head like you're asking a question and then back down to the bed, okay? We're gonna support at both joints. We're gonna go all the way up and all the way back down. Feel okay? Any pain? Okay, we're gonna do that again, all the way up and all the way back down. That's two, one more, all the way up and all the way back down, that's three. Feel okay? Okay, I'm gonna bring your arm out to the side now and back in like you're making a snow angel. Now notice I'm giving her examples that she would be familiar with, right? I'm not gonna say, I'm doing abduction, abduction on your left shoulder. While that makes me sound really smart, 
it doesn't help my patient understand what I'm doing with her body. So we're gonna go out to the side like you're making a snow angel and all the way back to start. There's one and there's two, feel okay? One more and three, good. Are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Oh, me too, me too. Okay, call it's right there in your hand if you need anything at all. Press that red button. I'll go see if I can find us a winning lotto, lotto ticket. I'm gonna open the curtain, look around. My environment's clean. I've washed my hands. Read the care plan one more time, make any corrections, and my skill is done. Thank you. I lose stuff all the time. Okay. All right, hold on. I gotta do this manually. Okay. So any questions on the um, skills that we learned today? Any questions on the skills? Okay, we're gonna move on to test registration. This is an entire packet. There are eight pages. All right, so I'm gonna go over this briefly with you, but you're not gonna get it all to, you know, right now when we're talking, cause there's eight pages. So I am gonna go over it briefly, but I wanna show you this resource. If you go onto my main website, which is foryourcna.com, you'll see a, a menu across the top. This is under testing. If you open that testing menu, you'll see test registration instructions. I have a video and step-by-step -step slides that tell you how to fill out this application exactly. Everything is covered from beginning to end. It also tells you how to register online. This registration packet that we're gonna to do together is an online registration. This is just the paper form of it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you what's expected and you can register online to speed this up, okay? So you have the paper registration packet if you wanna mail it in, but it's much better to do this online. So um, the first page, this page right here, test registration instructions, this page is gonna go through the process, the things that we need to know. The first thing that you need to do is make an appointment for a background check if you don't already have one. Now a background check for our purposes has to be done through a medical employer. So if you're currently working in medicine and you have a level two background with photo, they had to take your photo within the last five years. I had one There's no way for me to check. There's no way for you to check. Okay. So if you're unsure, get a background check done. I'm gonna show you how this whole process works and you'll understand a little bit better. Okay, but there's no way for you to check. But if you know you have one, I, I know like uh, you work in healthcare, right? So you've already had one for your current employment with photo in the last five years. So I know that yours would work. But if you, um, if you had fingerprints taken because you're a real estate agent, that doesn't work. If you had fingerprints taken because you're a foster parent, that doesn't work. If you had fingerprints taken to work at a bank, that doesn't work. It has to be for a medical 
employer to meet this purpose. If you need a background check, you can go on to deontis.com slash FL, register for an account and um, register for a background check. Our closest one is on Spring Hill Drive and Barclay. There's a UPS store. Yeah, that's where, that's where I have mine. Yep. So that that's our, our that's the best option. There are some others, but they don't all meet these needs. <laughs> I know Deontis does. Um, when you register for the background check, you need an ORI number. You'll find that in the first column in the shaded area. The ORI number zero through three eight zero H or EDOH zero three eight zero Z. You need that ORI number when you're registering for the background check. Once you get the background check done, this is step one, guys. Once you get the background check done, then you'll um, submit your registration for the test. The reason that it has to be done in this order is when you put your registration in for the test, when you submit it, you're gonna get an email back from Prometric. And that email looks like this. There's an attachment that looks like this. When you submit your application, you don't have this. When you submit your application for the test, they go look for your background check. They have to pull it and they put it with your application and send it off to the Board of Nursing because the Board of Nursing has to approve you. If you put your application in and they look and they don't see your background check, it's going to come back record not found and your application is dead. It's not going to move forward until you get a background check done. And that's going to delay things. So background check first. 24 hours later, you can apply for the test because it's that quick. When you apply, they go find that background check, put it with your application and send it to the Board of Nursing. When the Board of Nursing approves you, right here under eligibility approval, it's going to say approved and you're gonna get another email with your test date. That email is gonna look like this. It tells you your test date and location. You don't have these. These are up here, you can look at them, but you'll get, you know, just follow, follow along with what they email you. Does that make sense? So this whole process takes about two weeks. Get your background check done, register for the test. They pull your background check. They send it to the Board of Nursing to get approved. This is a, a personal eyes on, hands on approval. It is not automated. It is not done by a computer. A physical person looks at your application and your background check to make sure that you are safe to work with grandma. This takes about two weeks. Once they approve you, they send a, a message back to Prometric. Yes, you're approved. And when they get that approval, they schedule your test. Now, at the bottom of that page down here, you see our current testing locations. Now, we used to have one down here. We used to have one in Newport Ritchie. It, is, it has been closed, so our closest ones are in Tampa. There's one on the east side of Tampa which is over by Bush Gardens. And there's one on the west side of Tampa that's by the airport. You can see them there. The one that's Tampa by airport would be closer to us. Those of you who are in Citrus County, there's also one in Ocala. Yeah, you can choose any testing set. You can choose one in Miami if you want to jump on a cruise ship after you take your test. I mean, you can test anywhere in Miami. These are Go back. These are the test um, locations. Those are the test locations. This isn't up to date because it still lists Newport Ritchie. I'm waiting for them to update it on the website. But these are our current testing uh, locations that are active. Good? Questions? Okay, so let me go back. So when you're looking at this application, there's a couple things I wanna to bring to your attention and I already filled out one section for you because I wanna make sure you don't make any mistakes here. 
So the first thing that you see is a stop sign. It says, please make sure your name is your name. You have to have two forms of ID that have the same name, one with a picture, one with a signature. And that's the name you're gonna put on this application. It's gonna ask you if you need ADA accommodations, like do you have a seeing eye dog or do you need a sign language interpreter or something like that? Um, and then starts the actual application. So you'll see candidate information. You can fill that out on your own, turn the page. There's more candidate information. And then at the middle of page two, we get to criminal and Medicaid, Medicare fraud questions. I want to explain this. Please pay attention and have a pen. If you have a felony in your background, see me after class. Do not fill this section out, see me after class. If you have no felonies in your background, no felonies, for number one, check no and leave A, B, C, D, E blank. Do not answer those. Check no for number one. Go down to number two and check no. Turn the page, leave A and B blank. Number three, four, and five have to do with a very specific set of circumstances. If you worked for a medical professional and got convicted of fraudulent Medicaid or Medicare billing, and you were told you cannot work in healthcare anymore, these three apply to you. If you have not ever had that specific set of circumstances, three, four, and five are going to be no. Please, please make sure you do not check off any of the A's, B's, C's, or D's. If you do, it, it loops the computer and it will stall your certification. Okay. Sure. So, yep. If, if you have no felonies, number one and two are no. Three, four, and five, if you've ever worked for a medical provider who was convicted of Medicare and Medicaid fraud, and you specifically were told you cannot work in healthcare ever again, those three would apply to you. If you've never had that experience, it's gonna be no for three, four, and five. Okay, good. All right, Krim, um, uh, disciplinary history. This is asking if you've ever had a medical certification anywhere, Florida or any other state that was, um, had disciplinary action taken against it. So if you were an occupational therapist in Indiana 10 years ago, and you had your license taken away because of misconduct with a patient, you would have to declare that here. Okay, it's asking if you've ever had disciplinary action in Florida or any other state. Criminal history, self-explanatory. You either have one or you don't. If your answer is maybe, it's probably yes. <laughs> um, it's asking if you've ever had any records sealed or expunged. And the last question is juvie records. Were you young and dumb and got caught? Everybody was young and dumb. Did you get caught? <laughs> and then page four, you have to fill out on your own. I cannot help you with page four. I'm not allowed to help you with page four. Read the questions and answer them. Page five, I filled out most of this for you. You should have E3 checked off. Training information should be X'd out and regional test site should be X'd off. The test site code is what is on the down here, these test site codes. So when you choose wherever you wanna test, that's the code that would go in that box. If you're filling this out online, it's going to be a drop-down menu. You can choose the one you want. 
Now, exam selection at the bottom of page five. Um, is anybody here Spanish or first language? Anybody here Spanish or first language? No. Okay. So those of you who have, uh, who English is not your first language, you may, may want earphones where the computer reads the written test questions to you. If you want earphones for the computer to read the question to you, check off the second option. Everybody else check off the first option. Okay, clinical skills and written or with oral, one of those two. You can see the exam fee is 155. You're gonna pay that when you register. Next page, you have an affidavit there that you're going to check off. The affidavit says that you have had access to and read these two pages, this one and this one. This is their privacy policy. If you fill this out online, they will actually give you a link to these two things that you can read it. They're up here for you to read. It's just telling you how they're gonna use your information to clear you for testing. You're gonna check that box. It says, yes, you did read that privacy policy. And then you're going to sign and date at the bottom. Now at the bottom of the page, you see a statement that says, if you do not receive your emailed ATT letter, that is an authorization to test letter, ATT letter, within 10 to 14 business days, please contact Prometric. Notice they do not give you a phone number. So on this page, column three, very bottom, is Prometric's phone number. When you call, if you have to call, if you don't have your authorization to test, um, sometimes it pays to be persistent. Okay. They are better than they have been in the past. They are working on things, but sometimes we have to be persistent. Please make sure that you understand the timeline here. They're saying that you should be cleared in 10 to 14 days. If somebody tells you something like it can take up to 180 days, I want you to remember that your application says 10 to 14. Make sure you check your spam for sure. And then the last page is just your payment form. If you're gonna mail this application in, this is where you would put your payment form. They do not take personal checks or cash. You have to pay with money order, money order, cashier's check, or debit or credit card. And you can use that form to fill it out. If you're paying online, that would um, that will be, you know, a payment form will be there for you. One more thing about the online application, and I do recommend that you do the online application. It cuts processing time dramatically. So I do recommend that you use this as a template and do the online application. But if you do the online application at the very end, it's, at, it's gonna ask you a question. How are you going to um, submit um, supporting documents? That's what it says. And when you read that, you're like, what's the, I, I don't know what to send. I don't know what they're asking. Just click uh, on there um, by email. Just, just click by email, just remember that, just click by email um, or mail. I think it might be mail. What they're saying is if you have a criminal history and they have to contact you for more information, how are you going to give them those documents? Are you gonna fax it in or are you gonna mail it in? And I do not recommend faxing because there's no guarantee that they get it. So I always recommend sending it by mail um, just to make sure that you can show that you did submit it and that they did receive it. Okay, good. Remember, I have step-by-step -step instructions on my website. Go watch that video. At least watch it through once so you know what the process is before you start the online registration. It's not intuitive. Creating, creating an account with Prometric is not intuitive. 
you really kind of need to know what to click and where to start that whole process. Um, and that video will be very, very clear on how to do that. Right, if you've got a level background check with fingerprints and photo in the last five years for a medical employer, it'll be on hand. So how do you do that? No, it, it would be um, when you go somewhere and you don't have a background check on file, they would send you for one. Okay, so then you probably have one on file. You don't have to tell Prometric because it's it, it's in it's on file. When you fill out your application, they're going to go looking for it. When you fill out your application, you're saying, hey, I should have one already. And they just go look for it. If they don't find it, they're going to send you that form back and it says record not found. And that means you better go get one. But it is going to delay the process. So if you know for sure you have one, that's fine. If you're not sure, I would get one. Um, I think that you said Prometric, so that would be coded in EAMAIR for the airport. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, you are done for today. Have a fantastic weekend, guys. Two chapters of homework, five and six. Five is important, pay attention, it's on dementia. Six is skills, we're covering that in class. Read the paragraphs between the skills. All right, YouTube world. See if anybody's got any questions for me. Oops, sorry. All right. Um, thank you. All right. Looks like you guys are all good. Okay, guys. Uh, you two people, I will see you on Monday at 9 a.m. for class. Tomorrow we have our live question and answer session at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, make sure you tune in. Bye. Bye-bye.